Okay. Well, we are in session 11 of our review of the book of Genesis. And uh, it's in this particular case, we're going to be talking about Genesis chapter 6 and uh, the days of Noah. It may surprise you to see us out of 24 sessions spend a full session just on chapter 6. And there are some reasons I'm doing that. There are a number of places in the Bible where there are passages that are controversial, there are several different views, and what we try to do is present the different views so you can do your own homework and come to your own conclusion. And we'll do that this time, but I want to mention something that's different about this particular chapter, because I'm going to suggest to you that nine out of ten pastors are confused about Genesis chapter 6. And so we're going to move into an area that's kind of technical in some respects, I used to regard it as just a, a, a peripheral, kind of interesting, but peripheral issue. But as the years have gone by, and as I've done more research, I was startled to discover that understanding this chapter is foundational to understanding most of the Old Testament, as well as prophecy. It's not just a part of the misty chapters of early Genesis, it is very foundational to understanding the rest of the Bible. So we're going to, we're going to focus on this. And I want to remind you what Edmund Spencer said. We, we bring this up every once in a while. There is a principle which is a bar against all information. It's a proof against all argument. Which, and which cannot fail to keep man in everlasting ignorance. That principle is condemnation before investigation. What I'm going to ask you to do as we go into this session tonight is to set aside whatever you may have been taught or whatever you believe uh, uh, about chapter 6 and try to look at it with fresh eyes and try to hear what the text is saying. And my goal is not to sell you a particular view. My goal is to equip you to do your own homework, to do your own digging and come to your own conclusions. So... Uh, the same concept is in Proverbs 18.13. He that answereth a matter before he heareth it is a folly and a shame unto him. So set aside what prejudices you may have about these strange things that are going to go on in chapter 6 of Genesis. And let's try to op approach it openly and uh, uh, with an inquiring mind. And uh, what I used to do all the time uh, is always have you put at the top of your notepad my trademark. Acts 17.11. And that's where Luke tells you, don't believe anything Chuck Missler tells you, but receive the word of God with all openness of mind, yet search the scriptures daily to prove where those things be so. And I, I use that, I, for 30 years I've used that as a, as a trademark, and it applies no more emphatically than it does here. So we're going to talk about the biblical view of the days of Noah. That's a phrase that Jesus used, and we want to understand what it really meant. You may recall that four disciples came to Jesus privately. Peter, James, and John, and Andrew, Peter's brother, came to Jesus. He happened to be sitting on the Mount of Olives, so many people call his response to their questions the Olivet Discourse. And it's recorded in, uh, in, in uh, uh, three places, Matthew 24 and 25, Mark 13, and Luke 21 and 22. And... Uh, We'll look at the Matthew account. Since Matthew took shorthand, he had to. He was a tax, a tax customs official. That was a job requirement. Uh, he, his, his gospel uh, it has most of these taken down in verbatim. But in that discussion that Jesus, in responding to their question about his second coming, he opened his discussion and he closed his discussion, two-chapter discussion, with the admonition, take heed that no man deceive you. So you want to have your, your guard up on this one. But when you get down to verse 37 of Matthew 24, Jesus makes an interesting remark. He says, but as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. The whole passage has to do with his second coming. And uh, this is Matthew 24. In a couple of chapters, he's going to be crucified. He's got, he's, he, that, the, and that crucifixion was not a tragedy. It was an achievement. 
the, the details of which were laid down in Genesis 3, and the entire Bible focuses on that cross. But as he's preparing his disciples for his departure and reminding them that he is coming back and talking the details about his second coming, among the things he remarks, he refers to the days of Noah. And uh, what we want, we don't understand what he's talking about because most of us don't have any idea. We have no idea what the days of Noah were really like. Well, it was a day of great sinfulness. Indeed, it was. But if that's all there was, we better get some life jackets. Right? Okay. So what does that mean as part of the question? Well, we're going to explore. Genesis chapter 6 is preparatory to the ark and the flood and all of that. Most of us know all of How many of you know about Noah? Oh, well, you've heard of Noah before? About 80%. No? Mm. Okay. I'm kidding, of course. But the ark and all of that will be chapter 7, 8, and 9. 7 and 8, actually. And then 9 at the end of it. So we're going to focus, though, on chapter 6 tonight, particularly, because we need to understand that because there are some conditions that will impact your understanding of almost everything else in the Old Testament and also, and thus, the prophecies. So Genesis chapter 6, verse 1 and 2. Now, the first thing I want you to notice before we get in this, I want you to notice verse 1 and 2 are a single sentence. It's amazing how much confusion has been generated by splitting that single sentence into the two verses. Genesis 6, verse 1 and 2. It came to pass when men began, when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair, and they took them wives of all which they chose. Well, the first thing it hits us is, sons of God, what does that phrase really mean? The sons of God. You want you to notice when men began to multiply, that's men in general, no particular subset, were just men multiplied on the face of the earth, and they had daughters, we're talking daughters in general. We're not talking about a specific group of daughters. We're born of them. That the sons of God, whoever they were, we'll come back to that, saw the daughters of men that they were fair, they were attractive. I assume that was a general attribution. And they took them wives of all which they chose. That's kind of a strange phrase, by the way. In the Hebrew especially, it implies that they just, the wives didn't have much choice about it. They took them wives of all which they chose. And uh, so now, what about this word, sons of God? In the Hebrew, it's b'nei ha-elohim, ha-elohim, sons of God. But it's a phrase, to understand what it means, we need to examine the rest of the Bible. And you'll discover something interesting. That phrase is used of a direct creation of God. Okay, what did that include? Adam was a son of God. He was a direct creation of God. He fell, become sinful. You and I, as natural born sons and daughters, are sons and daughters of Adam in the natural. We, are, we, we have a genetic defect that's called sin. Therefore, we die. Well, babies are, in, are innocent. No, they die also. See, there's, even though they may be uh, 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 given certain... Um, allowances by God until they get the age of accountability, they also have a genetic defect called sin. We're sons of Adam, not sons of God. The term son of God in the scripture is always used of a direct creation of God. That includes Adam and it includes the angels. In fact, that particular phrase, if you search the entire Old Testament in the Hebrew, it's always used of angels. There are some similar passages used slightly differently, but that particular term uh, we maintain is a technical term referring to angels. Now I might mention something so you don't get confused. When you get to the Gospel of John, 1 John 11 and 12, speaking of Jesus Christ, he came unto his own, Israel, but his own received him not. But as many as did receive him, to them gave he the power to be what? Become the sons of God. And of life through his name. So the, the point is, that's why, that, and that gets explained in John chapter, that's in John 1. John 3, he explains it. There is a new birth involved. That's not a figure of speech. There's actually a creative event that takes place. 
when you receive Jesus Christ. That's why it's called a new birth. And that's why you are a new creature. You are then a direct creation of God, if you're a believer. And those aren't just idioms of, of, of spiritual philosophy or something. They are very, very real events. And if it happens, your life will be changed after that. It'll, have, it'll bear fruit. If there's no fruit, then you've got a problem. But let's move on. So the, the sons of God re refer to angels. Well, this leads then to a pretty weird set of views about this chapter. They are views that are not taught in most seminaries. I remember when we published uh, uh, our, some of our books and stuff, I got calls from vice presidents of major publishing companies that were angry, not at me, but to realize that they'd graduated from seminary in this particular case, and had never been even taught this view. It's not like, here's, I'm going to show you both views in a minute, but there's two views. These are the two views, take your pick. Most people had never been taught or taken seriously the view I'm going to show you. The sons of God, B'nai HaElohim, it always is used of angels in the Old Testament. In Job three times, Job 1, 6, 2, 1, and 38, 7. In Luke uh, uh, 20, verse 36 is the equivalent uh, uh, emphasis. There's a book called the Book of Enoch. It's not part of the Bible. It's not regarded as an authentic source. It is named after what may have been at one time an authentic source that's been lost, but it's a collection of views. But it's a very valuable book. It emerged about the second century before Christ, and what makes it valuable is not its content because it's not inspired, but it's very useful for grammar and vocabulary because it's Hebrew two centuries before Christ, and it deals with these issues. And, and it details this kind of thing. And so don't misunderstand me. I'm not suggesting the Book of Enoch is inspired literature. I am saying it's a useful reference point to understand the grammar and the vocabulary of that day. But even more so is the Greek translation of the Old Testament called the Septuagint. Three centuries before Christ's ministry, the Hebrew scriptures were translated into Greek. And we have four copies of that. That the, the, it's called the Septuagint, a fancy word for 70. 70 scholars were gathered in the center, literary center of the world called Alexandria in Egypt and uh, spent 15 years from 285 to 270 translating the Old Testament into Greek. Now what makes that so valuable is Greek is a very precise language. Incredibly, probably no language has ever come along as, as precise as Greek. Every verb has to fit five conditions and so forth. In the Septuagint, uh, the Septuagint translates this clearly as angels. And now it was done by the greatest Hebrew scholars three centuries before Christ's birth. So I'm going to suggest that, that at least in some of these cases it's very authoritative. Now, it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth and daughters were born of them that the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair. And now we get to, uh, we, we talked about Benai HaElohim, sons of God. The daughters of men, I want you to notice what that is, Banath Adam in the Hebrew. The view that is taught by many, most seminaries, is that, well, that really refers to the daughters of Cain. And they try to create a situation that the sons of God referred to the descendants of Seth, and the, the, the daughters were of Cain, and they weren't supposed to intermarry, and that's what's involved here. I'll deal with that more in detail in a minute, but I want you to notice that's not what the text says. Is the sons of God, Benai HaElohim, saw the Benathadam, that is the daughters of Adam. So these are general girls, not a girls of a particular, of either of Cain or Abel or Seth or whatever. Are you with me? Okay. Now when you get down to verse 4, it says there were Nephilim in the earth in those days and also after that when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men and they bare children unto them. The same became the Hagibarim, the mighty men, which were of old, men of renown. There were Nephilim. That's the Hebrew word. Unfortunately, it's translated as giants in many English translations. They did happen to be giants, but that's not what the word means. The word in the Hebrew is Nephilim. And uh, it's important to understand this word. It comes from a root meaning Nephal, the fallen ones. The, the, the verb nafal in the Hebrew is to fall or be cast down, to fall away or desert. If you're a deserter, 
or if you, you, you and so forth. You're a, uh, the verb is nephal. Nephilim are the fallen ones. So they were fallen ones. Now what on earth are they? Also in that verse was the Hagibarim, the mighty ones. And this, these Nephilim, in other words, when these angels, now these are fallen angels, these are bad guys, you'll see in a minute. When they found some way to procreate with women, human women, they gave birth to hybrids. They were different than either of their parents because they were part human and part not human. And these were the Nephilim. And this idea shocks many people. It's very disturbing to many people, but let's try to keep an open mind and see what the scripture says and see what implications it has in our understanding, not just of the flood of Noah, but the rest of the Old Testament. Now, again, the Septuagint takes this word, uh, Nephilim, and treats it, uh, translated as gigantes. Because it's gigantes, when they translated from the Septuagint to the English, they called them giants. It sounded like giants. That's not what the word means, by the way, but you can understand why they did that. That's, they really transliterated. So they translated, in most English Bibles, as giants. The word from, comes from gigas, which means earthborn. And it's the same word that they use in Greek mythology for titans. Titans in Greek mythology were the, were the uh, offspring of, of gods, uh, Greek gods, cohabiting with women. They were the demigods, half god, half man. Titans, Atlas, Hercules, these were in mythology, these kinds of creatures. So that's what the word is the word, uh, used for. The word genea means to breed uh, and or be of a certain kind. And uh, the English word genes or genetics comes from the same Greek root. And there may be a linkage here that may surprise you that we'll get into this a little bit. Well, Genesis 3 said, And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for he also is flesh, yet his days shall be 120 years. So from this announcement, there's 120 years before the big event, which we'll talk about. And then verse 4, there were giants in the earth in those days. That's the, way it'd be, that's the way it would be in your Bible. The word is Nephilim. We're going to talk a lot about Nephilim in the earth in those days. And, also, and notice this. And also after that, these things occurred in those days and they gave rise to the flood. But there's a phrase in here we're going to, re, we're going to come back to later. And also after that, it didn't end with the flood. It was so universal that the flood dealt with it. But we're going to discover it wasn't limited to that. There's been some incident since then. Anyway, and they, when the sons of God, the Baniah Elohim, came in unto the, the Benoth Adam, and they bare children unto them. The same became mighty men, which were of old, men of renown. Now, when you get down to verse 9, we're going to be dealing with some other verses here in a minute, but I want to, give you, I want to look ahead a little bit. In verse 9 of chapter 6, there is a remark about Noah that unless you're very careful, unless you have, do some exegetical homework, you won't, you'll miss the meaning of it. It says, these are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations, and Noah walked with God. Now here's that phrase again. We ran into that phrase um, with Enoch, didn't we? Noah walked with God. Uh, he was a just man. That doesn't, doesn't mean he was sinless, but it does mean he was uh, uh, he, he was righteous before God because he was faithful and obedient. But there's a phrase in here that most people miss. These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations. And Noah walked with God. Now that word perfect in the Hebrew is tamim. It always refers to a physical blemish. It, it, tamim means without a blemish. Sound, helpful, without spot. Unblemished, in other words. Unimpaired. Well, wait a minute. What does it mean when it says that his genealogy was unimpaired? You see, it wasn't tainted by this, 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 these, these goings-on with these fallen angels. The human race was getting contaminated. In fact, I believe it was Satan's strategy to contaminate the human race to prevent a redeemer that was promised in Genesis 3. But Noah is an exception. He may not have been the only exception, but what was distinctive with Noah and his gang is that they were untainted by these goings-on of the Nephilim, I mean, of the, uh, of the fallen angels. 
Now you say, gee, this, this sounds pretty weird stuff, Chuck. You're saying that these angels cohabited with women and gave birth to hybrids. Well, if that's a pretty weird idea. But if it's true, it's going to be confirmed in at least two places elsewhere in the Bible, right? Two or three witnesses this, the, the law requires. If you turn to Jude, verse 6 and 7, that's the, chapter, that's the book just before the book of Revelation in the New Testament. Jude is making an argument that I'm not going to try to recreate here to take the time, but in, it is, he makes, in his argument, he makes reference in verse 6 of this little book. He says, and the angels which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, he hath reserved in everlasting chains under darkness unto the judgment of that great day. So Jude here, Jude's the brother of Jesus Christ. He's writing this little short epistle. He's speaking of angels that did something wrong. They, left their, they, they kept not their first estate, but they left their own habitation. I'll come back to that word in a minute. He hath reserved in everlasting chains under darkness unto the judgment of their great day. Then he goes on to amplify this for us in, the, in verse 7. He says, even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them, in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh, are set forth an example, for an, for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. So here we have an allusion by Jude that these angels, which apparently went after strange flesh, which God because of that, they are reserved in everlasting chains and under darkness. So they're, they're, they're given a very special treatment. Well, this left their own habitation going after strange flesh. These are angels it's talking about here. The word habitation, here's another technicality. You'll find, uh, you, you, you won't find this uh, in most uh, textbooks, but let me just give it. The word in the Greek in the habitation is okaterian. It only occurs twice in the New Testament. Here in Jude, and, it, uh, and in 2 Corinthians 5 2. What does this word okaterian mean? It means habitation, like a habit or a habitation. Well, it's used in a only twice in the Bible. In Jude 6, we just read, it's what these angels left. These angels left their habitation. Here it says, it's in a positive sense, it's speaking of the believer. For in this we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed upon with our, and the same word, okaterian which is from heaven. When we put this together, the angels that sinned shed the, 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 the place they were living in, the body they were living in, in order to participate in this sin with human beings. That term is the body that you and I aspire to. We would use the term resurrection body. See, for in this we groan earnestly desiring to be clothed upon with our habit or habitation house which is from heaven you and I as believers aspire to having that have an okaterian which is given to us by God it's our immortal bodies but that term is what these angels shed in order to participate in this mischief in Genesis 6 let's look at another place Second Peter chapter 2 verse 4 and 5 Peter makes a reference to the same thing again he says for if God spared not the angels that sinned but cast them down to Tartarus, I'll come back to that word, and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment, and spared not the old world, but saved Noah, and then he goes on. So Peter does two things here. He introduces to a word Tartarus, I'll come back to, but he also links these angels that sinned with the days of Noah. See, God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down, delivered them into chains of darkness, reserved unto judgment, and spared not the old world, but saved Noah, and he goes on to talk about Noah's and the ark and all that business. Now, he uses the word Tartarus. That word does not occur anywhere else in the Bible. It's translated hell in your English Bible. But what kind of a hell is it? The word Tartarus in the Greek is widely used in Greek, not in biblical Greek, but in Greek. Tartarus is the Greek term for a dark abode of woe. In fact, it's considered the pit of darkness in the unseen world. Um, in Homer's Iliad, that classic uh, Greek thing, it is rendered as, it is as far below Hades as the earth is below heaven. What does that mean? I don't know, but I don't want to go there. Okay. Now, it's very possible that it might be synonymous with the abuso. That's speculation. We're not sure. We'll see. But that's another story. Now, what's interesting about this weird view that I'm sharing with you about Genesis 6, we'll discover that it, that same idea is embodied 
in the myths and legends of every culture, ancient culture, on the planet Earth. Let's, we're best known as the, the Greek Titans. The Greek mythology t speaks of these demigods that are partly terrestrial, partly celestial. They apparently rebelled against their father Uranus. And after a prolonged contest, they were defeated by Zeus and condemned into Tartarus. Again, that's what the word comes from. And uh, by the way, it's interesting that Zeus is not the creator. I've been doing a little study in Greek mythology. I'm fascinated. You know, I always thought, well, Zeus is their name for God. Not exactly, because Zeus is still not the creator. So it's interesting. They don't reach that far in, in their thing. Anyway, here's pictures as, as Zeus is often rendered, who is the, their, you know, their, the, the top guru here. And then you have Hercules. You all read, heard about Hercules. You all heard about Atlas. In the Greek mythology, these would be in the Hebrew called Nephilim. They were offspring of human mothers and, 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 uh, and, and, and uh, Greek myth mythological gods as parents. Now, if you study ancient legends, you'll discover the ancient, most earliest culture, Sumer, has these legends, Assyria, Egypt, Incas, Mayan, Gilgam uh, Gilgamesh and Babylon, uh, Persia, Greece, of course. Most of us are familiar with the Greek versions of this mythology. India, Bolivia, South Sea, even the American Indians speak of the star people that came down and so forth. And uh, there, I came across a fascinating reference in a book that was considered at the time very reliable, the autobiography of William Cody, commonly known as Buffalo Bill. And if you look at Buffalo Bill's autobiography, Colonel William F. Cody in 1920, there's a paragraph, I put part of it in here. He says, while we were in the Sand Hills scouting the Neobarra country, the Pawnee Indians brought into camp some very large bones, one of which the surgeon of the expedition pronounced to be the thigh bone of a human being. The Indians said the bones were those of a race of people who long ago had lived in that country. They said these people were three times the size of a man of the present day, and they were so swift and strong that they could run by the side of a buffalo and taking the animal in one arm could tear off a leg and eat it as they ran. The bone was too big, they didn't have wagons, so they didn't keep it. So they, he recorded it in his journal. So I don't know what to make of that, but I think it's interesting. You'll discover if you study Indian lore that the Indians were terrified of the six-fingered people. That's why when they met a stranger, they held up the hand to prove they only had five fingers. This how business is Hollywood, but the, the idea of greeting a stranger with your hand so you could count fingers. You'll find that recorded in the pictographs in, uh, pictographs in uh, uh, Chaca, New Mexico, among other places. Anyway, moving on. There is a book that I, uh, that I have a extensive library, but uh, someone was kind enough to add this to it, by Stephen Quayle, which is an encyclopedia of giants, all relating to Genesis 6 and other subjects. And uh, this came out in 2002. I'm just giving you a couple of snapshots. It's amazing. He has a catalog here of hundreds of giants in human history that we have records of or pictures of. Here's a couple of guys. You wouldn't want to meet them in a dark alley, would you? Um, <laughs> Uh, here's a guy nine foot, uh, nine foot four inches, Machnoff uh, and uh, Chiquita. Two, uh, uh, two of these are, of course, used in, in shows and stuff back in the uh, you know, turn of the century. Uh, here's a gal by the name of Lady Ama. She's she was tw 20 years, 22 years old, seven foot nine inches, with two elder sisters. You notice this, the, the one of them is very is very small. She ends up uh, marrying a Chinese dwarf. These are from the late 19th century. Here's Captain Martin Van Buren and his wife, Mrs. Ann Bates. Uh, both of them about eight feet tall. She was actually a little taller than he was, or very close to it. He was born in Kentucky in 1847, and they, of course, uh, were on ex exhibit throughout Europe, but these are, pictures were part of the promotion and so forth. Um, I, I could go on and on, but uh, just to give you some feel, there, the, the, there are records of giant people, 10, 13 feet kinds of people, and, and skeletons, hundreds of them. It's a st one part of Stephen Quayle's book highlights the fact that for strange reasons, they always get covered up. You really have to do some digging to get the records and stuff. He spent 30 years pulling, the, pulling his encyclopedia together. But uh, there's a genetic discovery I want to share with you. Scientists at Johns Hopkins University have discovered that there's a gene in mice which controls growth. It's called GDF8. In other words, growth differentiation factor 8. Disrupting GDF8 will result in super mice that are two to three times larger and much stronger than normal mice. And this was published in Nature, a reputable journal, in April 30th of 1997. So it's interesting to me, don't confuse hormonal growth, 
some people are large because of hormones, but they, when they get bigger, they get weaker. We're talking about a genetic difference here, and also, I'm assuming, a genetic difference in the Nephilim. You follow me? Because the Nephilim become supermen, very large and, uh, and very terrifying. And uh, so, now it's interesting, by the way, speaking of genetics here now, it's interesting, in the Bible, there's the death penalty for lying with a beast, sleeping with an animal, in the, in the sexual sense. If a woman lies with a beast, both shall be killed, not only the beast, but the woman. That's in Leviticus 20, verses 15 and 16, I'll give you an example. This, see, this all deals with confusion. And one of the questions we can ponder as we drive home tonight, does the genetic transfers of human DNA into animals suggest that we are entering the period which Jesus likened to the days of Noah? This genetic thing is, you know, is, is going to get more complicated, especially as we cross species lines. We're introducing confusion. We're going to open the door for diseases that we have no answer to and so forth. And so we're entering a, a very nightmarish era. And that's exactly what Revelation talks about in terms of, of uh, Revelation chapter 6 and so on. Well, it, it's interesting, as you travel the ancient world, you find these gods or super gods modeled in all the ancient writings. They have the flying god Ashur. <clears throat> and this guy shows up everywhere, on, on pyramids, on walls. Uh, as you go through Egypt, he's on all the thresholds. Um, as you go up there, you'll see, you'll see, you'll see it right in the middle of the, 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 these winged things. And of course, some people feel that these may be allusions to flying saucers and what have you. And so uh, we won't get into that here. We did publish a book called Alien Encounters, which deals with this and, and, and explores the possibility that it may have some relationship to the uh, uh, in, increasing uh, occurrence of, of, uh, of, uh, flying, of UFOs and so on. But there is a different view. The view I'm going to show you now is the way this material is classically taught in most seminaries. And as a result, most pastors, I'll show you some exciting exceptions, but uh, I, I'm talking about conservative pastors, and I'm talking about the general uh, uh, run-of-the-mill run of pastors. They talk about Genesis 6 in terms of what's called the line of Seth. And the view is that the sons of God, that phrase, refers to Seth, the leadership of Seth. Seth, they, they paint this picture, Abel's been killed by Cain, right? Then there comes Seth. Well, Cain's the bad guy, Seth's the good guy, is the, is, the, is, the, is, the, is the fabric they try to create. And the sons of God is a phrase, they, they argue, that refers to the Sethite leadership. By the way, there's not a scrap of biblical reference that supports this. This is just the way it's taught. The daughters of Adam really means the daughters of Cain. And the big mistake that was made, presumably, is that the Sethite leadership commingled with the daughters of Cain, and that was, that was supposed to be a no-no. And there's some problems with that. The sin in this was a failure to maintain separation. There's a problem with this because separation isn't called for until chapter 11. They weren't told to keep, keep separate, by the way. So this, this is all very contrived. But even when you go through this, the other question is, well then, fine, if you've got believers and unbelievers marrying, who are these Nephilim? When a believer and an unbeliever get married and have children, the children can turn out to be monsters, but they're not monstrous. <laughs> They're not genetically distinctive. You with me? You, you see the difference? These Nephilim are genetically distinctive. And uh, this whole idea of the line of Seth emerged in the 5th century. Celsus and Julian the Apostate used the traditional belief in, you know, of the angel view of Genesis 6 to attack Christianity. Because it's a weird idea. A lot of people rebel at this idea. Angels having, you know, it's, it's unpleasant. So a guy by the name of Julius Africanus resorted to the Sethite theory as a more comfortable way with dealing with the text. He contrived this idea, well, what it really means is this, you know. It doesn't mean what it says, it means that it's really referring to such and so. And of course, then the serial of Alexander used it to repudiate the orthodox position, because in leaning on Africanus. But the real mistake came when Augustine embraced the Sethite view, and because he did, and because of his stature, it became the orthodox view, the lines of Seth, is the view that's, even to this day, still taught about this passage. And uh, this, thus it became part of the Catholic Church, and it prevailed through the Middle Ages. And most Protestant or denominations that derived from the Reformation kept, they, they dragged this baggage along without reexamining it. And uh, now, and so it's commonly taught today. When I'm teaching you here, you're going to have to, be, you're going to have to 
do some digging to, to even come across the, what's called the angel view of Genesis 6. But the text itself, the sons of God is never used of believers in the Old Testament. That's what the Sethite view would require. Seth was not God. Cain was not Adam. These were daughters of Adam, not daughters of Cain, right? So forth. And there's no, there's no mention of daughters of Elohim. There's bar, sons of God, but there aren't daughters. Are there no daughters of Elohim? What, what's the point? And um, there's also some grammatical problems with that that I won't bore you with. That gets technical, so we'll move on. And uh, the lines were separated in Genesis 11. That's when that was composed upon Isaac, not for Ishmael or anybody else, just on Isaac. All, by the way, if the Sethites were the good guys, right, that's the theory of the Seth view, why did they drown in the flood? You see, all flesh was corrupted according to Genesis 6, verse 12. So this idea of the Sethite view, as it's called, if you start examining it from a textual basis, falls apart, makes no sense. Now, the inferred godliness of Seth is suspect because who was his son? Remember, see, only Enoch and Noah's eight were spared. Noah and his three sons, that's four people, and their four wives. Eight people in that ark. Enoch's pulled out ahead of time. Those eight are miraculously preserved in the ark. Well, where are the Sethites if they're such good guys? Remember, these, the Nephilim took wives as they chose. And why did the Sethites perish in the flood? And by the way, something else you may recall from last session, Enosh, which was Seth's son, is the guy that initiated the defiance of God. He's the first apostate. That last verse in chapter 4 is mistranslated. In the days of Enosh, men began to call upon the name of the Lord. That's mistranslated. They began to defy, call upon idols and so forth. Very important translation issue we talked about last time. Men began to profane the name of the Lord according in Genesis 4.26. That's the Targum of Angelos, which is in the Jewish community regarded as the translation. The Targum of Jonathan. Kimchi, Rash, and the other rabbinical scholars all agree. Jerome agrees. Maimonides, which is probably the most venerated of the Hebrew sages of the 12th century in his commentary on the Mishnah. Make, the point is the ancient Hebrew uh, sages understood the angel view. That's the main point I'm getting here. And... Uh, Daughters of Cain is the concept. There's not a subset of the daughters of Adam. Cainites were not necessarily godless. Remember, Cain, yes, he murdered his brother, but remember how that chapter, that chapter ends with his genealogy. He names his son with the name of God in it. He, be, he was a repentant believer. Yes, he did murder, and yes, he's suffering for it, but he, his children were God-fearing, apparently, at least some of them. And uh, the other question about the lines of Seth that they don't have an answer for, were the daughters of Seth so unattractive? Why are the Sethite leadership going after daughters of Cain? What's wrong with the daughters of Seth? Are they ugly or what's the problem? Um, anyway, but the uh, unnatural offspring is the, is the final nail in the coffin of the Sethite thing. The, the, the supernatural offering, the, 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 the text implies that the offering, the Nephilim, were the mighty men, the Hagabarim. And, uh, and to give you an example of one is Goliath. He was a descendant of, of Anak. Anak was one of the Nephilim. And of course, this whole issue of uh, no ex. Uh, uh, chromosomes among the Sethites. There were no women of renown, men of renown, right? No women of renown. And so what made, and then the other question is, what made Noah's genealogy so distinctive that it gets a mention in verse 9? Because it was unblemished. These others were blemished. Now the New Testament, as I point out, confer, uh, uh, confirms this three times. In Jude 6 and 7, we looked at that. 1 Peter 3, 19 and 20. And 2 Peter 2, verses 4 and 5. So we went, we went through those. Now, the angel view before Christ was the, is all, all through the traditional rabbinical literature. It's in the book of Enoch, as I mentioned before. It's the testimony of the 12 patriarchs. It's in Joseph, uh, uh, excuse me, uh, Josephus. Josephus talks, he's clearly, he, he, he takes for granted the angel view in his writings. And the Septuagint, as I mentioned. So if you look at the record that we would regard as useful, it uh, clearly, it knows no other view than really the angel view. The church fathers in the early church, Philo of Alexandria, Justin Martyr, Irenaeus, Athenagoras, Tertullian, Lactinius, and Am uh, Ambrose is missing, it should be Ambrose, and uh, Julian. Um, let's talk about modern day. If you read the writings of G.H. Pember, M.R. D. Hahn, C.H. McIntosh, Dillich, Kyle and Dillich are the authoritative commentaries in the Old Testament in most uh, th seminary libraries. Um, Gabeline, Arthur W. Pink, Donald Gray Barnhouse, Henry Morris down in San Diego, 
Merrill Unger, an expert on demonology. Arnold Fruchtenbaum, one of the greatest contemporary Jewish scholars on the, who knows his Bible. And Hal Lindsey, Chuck Smith. I had a guy that didn't really buy this, a good friend of mine, a guy by the name of Tim LaHaye. And uh, Tim and I used to have some discussions, and he wouldn't, he wouldn't fight me on it. He just couldn't quite. I got a letter from him just a couple days ago. It was, uh, the subject letter was some other things congratulating us on the, the, the verdict that we got in that trial and so forth. But, uh, but he also, in a letter, says, Chuck, you finally convinced me. Because he's apparently, for some other reasons, he's doing some research and some writing, and he's got all our tapes. He's gone through them three times. And he, he, he finally, in his letter, he says, you finally convinced me on the, on the angels of Genesis 6. And so I could add his name here too, I suppose. But uh, anyway. So the Sethite view is, is shattered by the text itself, by the inferred separation, by the inferred godliness of Sethites, the inferred Canaanite subset of the Adamites, the unnatural offspring called Nephilim, New Testament confirmations. But here is the real shocker to me. Up till now, that was my view. But as I've doing, been doing some homework in recent years, I also realized you will not understand what happened after the flood and most of the prophecies through the Old Testament unless you understand this background. If you miss this, uh, so I always felt, well, okay, there's two different views. I hold this one, they hold that one. Who cares? Let's go on. I discovered, no, this turns out to be important foundation to understand the rest of the Old Testament because you're going to run into in the Old Testament a term called the Rephaim. The word Repha means dead. It also means, um, uh, it can mean um, uh, 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 ghost or spirit but it's often the referent are the dead ones but see they're not they're the walking dead you'll discover in Genesis 6 4 when we talked about the Nephilim it says and also after that after the flood we run into people called the Rephaim now one of the questions that lurks behind this study will be who built the ancient monuments you know the world is littered with monuments that defy explanation, not just the Great Pyramid and Stonehenge. There are palaces and things and temples in which the rocks are the size of boxcars. And they come from hundreds of miles away. And there's all kinds of theories, but the truth is no one really knows how these things were built. And this doesn't explain it, but it begins to, there's a hint that there's, see the Great Pyramid of Giza is one, the Stonehenge in Britain. And there's a circle of ref, uh, what's known as a circle of Rephaim up in the Golan Heights. Nan and I were up there once. We got a four by four and we went up there. And uh, 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 the, uh, the, we, you can, this is an aerial, you can't tell this from the ground. When you're in the air, you realize it's a Stonehenge type structure. It's called the Gilgal Rephaim. It's up in the Golan Heights, up near Bashan. And we're going to talk more about that as we go. Um, there are five circles that involve 20 ton stones. The diameter is about 155 meters. It's dated to about 3000 BC. It's built on a flat plateau. It's only visible, you can only tell its architecture when we're getting above it. And uh, it's about 10 mi miles from Ashtaroth, Karnim, and it's in Genesis, Joshua. We won't spend a lot of time on that here. There's some other ruins. These have never been excavated, by the way, because they're up there in this, in this, in, up in the Glan, where it's, it's, it's tension. When we take some pictures, there were shells dropping about 1,000 yards away. Um, training, training stuff, but still. After the flood, it says also after that, we discover You'll be introduced in Genesis 14. There's at least four tribes, the Rephaim, the Emim, the Horim, and the Zamzumim, that God instructs Joshua to wipe out every man, woman, and child of those certain tribes. When you read that in the Old Testament, as a New Testament reader, you, you, it's hard to relate to that because they are instructed not to compromise, to wipe out every man, woman, child. And you, need to understand, you won't understand that unless you realize there's a gene pool problem. When we get to Genesis 15... God is going to give Abraham, Genesis 12, 15, and 17, deals with God's covenant with Abraham where he commits the land to Abraham. And he tells Abraham what's going to happen. You're going to go away and your descendants will come back here after 400 years. He goes through that prophecy. Well, when God tells Abraham that, Satan suddenly knows that he's got four centuries to lay down a minefield. And so the mischief that led to the the the, the flood of Noah, that was worldwide, which was taken care of by the flood, that same mischief apparently was, in, it was indulged in in the land of Canaan to provide these giants to prevent Israel from taking its possession. Satan has always tried to oppose God's plan, and he gave that land to Israel. So in those days, he had these giants 
Today, he's got the PLO and the UN. But let's move on. <laughs> In Numbers 13, you remember when Moses sent the 12 spies out and took Joshua and Caleb back and said, let's go get them. God's with us. But the other 10 were terrified. They said, we are as grasshoppers in their sight. Why? Verse, 13, uh, verse 33 of Numbers 13, there were Nephilim in the land. That actual Hebrew word is used there. And uh, Arba, Anak, and his seven sons were known as the sons of Anak, or the Anakim. Uh, they were encountered in Canaan. Their descendants, you will remember, one had a group of brothers. His name was Goliath, Right? Uh, uh, and so on. So um, these guys are 10, 13 feet tall. These are, these are not just overgrown. These aren't basketball guys. These are different breed altogether. There was a king, Og, the king of Bashan. Up in the Galan Heights, the biblical area is called Bashan. And Og, the king of Bashan, is known in Deuteronomy 3 and Joshua 12 and elsewhere as the king of the giants. He was the king of these gigantic races that were derivative from some kind of undisclosed mischief by these angels again, a, a Satan's a, a emissaries. And Goliath and his four brothers. See, when you read all about David, and he goes across, when he's, as a kid, he's going to take on Goliath. Notice when he stops at that brook, he picks up five stones. How many did he need for Goliath? One. What are the other, the other four, their lack of faith? No. He was ready for all of them. Give you a whole insight to this kid. You can study the Bible from cover to cover in terms of Satan's strategy to try to thwart the plan of God. As, as God reveals that there's going to be a redeemer, a seed of the woman, Satan knew he had to deal with the human race. The corruption of Adam's line was his first shot, apparently. Well, maybe, maybe Cain and Abel was part of it, but by corrupting the firstborn there. Abraham's seed, when, when God starts to tell, tell Abraham, that calls Abraham, tells him the Redeemer is going to come from his seed, then Abraham, it allows Satan to focus his attack now, not on everybody, just on Abraham. The feminine, famine in Genesis 50 and others. When you get to Exodus, the destruction of the male line by Pharaoh is all part of Satan's provocation. Even after Pharaoh lets him go on Passover, he changes his mind, goes after him, right? To what? To wipe them out. Pharaoh's pursuit in Exodus 4, 14. And then, of course, the whole population of Canaan, to prevent them from getting in there, is, is part of what we're going to be dealing with here. When God finally reveals that it's going to be not just through Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and through the tribe of Judah, even any time God does it, allows Satan to focus. But when he reveals that it's going to be out of the house of David, that allow, in 2 Samuel 7, that allows Satan to focus his attacks on the house of David. And in the royal line, again and again and again, we find the royal kids, the heirs to the throne, are killed. There's an attempt to wipe out all the heirs, except always there's a servant that hides a baby. There's all kinds of these, all through the, there are these intrigues. The Arabians slew all but Hezariah, who was hidden. Athalia, she ends up killing everybody, but Joash escapes. Hezekiah is assaulted in Isaiah 36 and 38. Remember, when you get to the Persian Empire, Haman is trying to wipe out the entire Jewish race. Why? Well, it's prejudice. No, it's more, more, something more deeper than not, not just that simple. It's an attempt to thwart the plan of God. And you wonder, why is Satan still at it today? Because there's a prerequisite condition for the second coming of Christ. That's for Israel to repent and to ask him to return. And they will. But it'll take the tribulation to drive them to it. In, uh, in the New Testament, Joseph fears when Mary's pregnant. That was punishable by death. She's feared. He fears for her. Matthew 1. Herod's attempt to killing the babes at Bethlehem. We celebrate every Christmas that comes up. That's Satan's attempt to thwart the plan of God. At Nazareth, in, 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 when Jesus opens his ministry in Luke 4, they try to throw him off a cliff. Then there's storms at sea. And by the way, there's two of them, not just one. In Mark 4 and Luke 8, you'll discover if you study those storms, they were not, in my opinion, natural storms. Why? Because there were sailors aboard that are familiar with those waters that knew about storms, and they were terrified. That tells me something else is going on. They were supernaturally induced, I believe. And that's why Jesus rebukes the storm. Interesting. Check the words. And, of course, the ultimate strategy was the cross. 
And all of this is summarized for you in Revelation 12. And Revelation's got this dramatic book, but there's a chapter set aside, chapter 12, where it reviews from the seed of the woman until the rapture. In fact, beyond the rapture. So Satan's still at it, and he's not through. What does the Galan Heights, Hebron, and the Gaza Strip have in common? You read those in the news lately? They were the areas that Joshua failed to exterminate the Rephaim in Joshua 15 and so forth. If you do a study of the book of Judges, the strongholds that failed to defeat Israel completely in the book of Judges are the parts that are colored on the map. Those are the territories that to this day are still remaining in dispute. And where's their capital? In Jericho, Bet Yal, the house of the moon god. Interesting, isn't it? Isn't that fascinating? I think it's interesting. Then tell me demons are not territorial. <laughs> there is a very, very strange verse in Psalm 22. All of us read Psalm 22. It sounds as if it was dictated, first person singular, by Jesus as he hung on the cross. It opens up with, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And it closes closes with it, it's done, it's finished. And, uh, but in the middle, and we always look at that with great, it, it's incredible uh, as you go through that. But right in the middle of it, there is a strange verse in verse 12. Jesus apparently saying, many bulls have compassed me. Strong bulls of Bashan have beset me round. Now Bashan is what we call the Golan Heights, and it was well known as cattle raising country. Bulls of Bashan was an idiom. It may be that's what he means. A bunch of cattle down there? I don't think so. I suspect, don't know this, I'm just guessing here, but I suspect this is a demonic phrase. That the bulls of Bashan is referring to something supernatural. And there's another issue that surprises me that more experts, people who have really specialized in this field, have not seen the discernment. And that's the distinction between fallen angels and demons. All through the Bible we find fallen angels. We just talked a lot about them so far today. When you get the New Testament, you run into these strange things that we generally call demons. Are they equivalent or are they distinctive? There are experts, Merrill Unger being one of them, that are really, that's their world, is demonology, that don't make the distinction I'm going to suggest to you here, so you have to decide for yourself. The nature of angels. What do we know about angels? We'll go through the Bible and discover they always appear in human form. They never look like anything. They don't look like lizards or elephants. They, they, they normally look like they're in human form. It's Sodom and Gomorrah. They're, they're always in pairs, too, usually, by the way. Sodom and Gomorrah, remember? At the resurrection, they were there, a couple of them. At the ascension, there's a couple of them, right? Always look like men, right? They spoke so you could understand them. They took men by the hand. They ate meals with them, right? Paul even admonishes you in his New Testament epistles. To, in terms of hospitality, many of you have entertained angels unawares. That's, Paul, that's, so Paul's, that's Paul's perception there, okay? They are capable of direct physical combat. The Passover in Egypt was accomplished by an angel doing the Lord's bidding. Angel of death is referred to in some places. One night after dinner, one angel slaughters 185,000 Syrian soldiers. I don't know how many soldiers were there. It wouldn't surprise me. There were twice that many if they slid every other throat. That's what the Turks used to do just to scare everybody to death. You wake up in the morning and find every other, you know, that's demoralizing to a group. Because um, the word gets around, see? But anyway, the slaughter of 185,000. You don't mess with angels. By the way, Jesus said they don't marry. That causes a lot of confusion. I'll come back to that. He says the angels in heaven don't marry. But angels are always referred to in the masculine. And you say, well, that's just a figure of speech. No. Study carefully Genesis 19. What the homosexuals of that city wanted Lot to deliver his guests. So they draft out. I don't have to get more graphic than that. Now, in contrast to these things, when we run into demons in the New Testament, they're very different. They seem to be powerless except to the extent they can indwell someone. They apparently always seek embodiment. That's why they petitioned to go into the swine and all that. At Gadara, you know the story. Jesus uh, said, for in the resurrection, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels of God. He's referring to believers. When he, in the resurrection, they neither marry or are given in marriage, but are as angels of God in heaven. Meaning, what he means by that, is they are immortal. You don't, a, someone that is mortal needs to procreate. Someone that's immortal doesn't procreate. That's his point. Now, he doesn't say, he's talking about the angels that are in heaven, the ones that are well-behaved. 
I personally would not put any limitations on the technology available to an angel that's bent on mischief. That's, the, that's my real point, I think. The word habitation, I've covered this before, the Akaterian, refers to the body as a dwelling place for the spirit. It occurs only twice. In Jude 6, from the, which the angels disrobed, and in 2 Corinthians 5, 2, the heavenly body to which us, we as believers long to be clothed with. And I, 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 uh, the, the word habitation in, in one place is the same as the word house in the other place. Well, let's back up a little bit and talk about warfare. When we were in Genesis 3, verse 15, we had God declaring war on Satan. He said, I'll put enmity between thee and the woman, between thy seed and her seed. And he shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Everybody quotes this as the first, is the first link in the chain of prophecies about Jesus Christ. And that's where he gets the title, the seed of the woman. But many people miss that there's two seeds here. There's the seed of the woman, and there's the, the, uh, the, the seed of of the serpent. He later is called the red dragon in Revelation 12. He's the coming world leader, I call him. I don't like the term Antichrist because it's, it's too limiting. And he's, uh, he has a sidekick by the name of the false prophet. So with Satan and the coming world political leader and the false prophet at his side, you've got a satanic counterfeit of a trinity. Everything Satan does is a counterfeit. And these are the forces behind the world today. And J Daniel chapter 10 is your recommended study on the details of all of that. When you get to Daniel 2, and Daniel, you, 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 we have the four, the famous event of Daniel 2 is by way of review. We have Babylon, Persia, Greece, then Rome in two phases. And Daniel chapter 7 is laid out. Same subject, different idioms. But again, we have those same empires. But we get to these, in, in Daniel 2, we have the iron mixed with clay, remember? There's all this, all this speculation. We have, you know, the head we know is gold is Babylon, the silver is Persia, the brass is green, the legs are iron, but the feet are iron mixed with clay. What on earth is the clay? And I've taught this for 30 years before I realized Daniel explains who the clay is. And of course, uh, the last two are iron, uh, two phases of the same empire. But uh, we know that we're heading for a world order, a world without borders. We talked about that a lot, uh, the, the whole idea of... of uh, of these things are, and it's, it's coming. Global government's happening for at least three reasons. The nuclear proliferation is part of it. You've got to have global governance. Uh, terrorism is a worldwide thing. It knows no borders. But there's also the possibility that we're going to be unified in a world government for a cosmic threat. General MacArthur said that. Reagan said it three times in public speeches. Many people miss that. That one thing will unite this world will be a threat from the outside. But to get back to this, what is the miry clay in Daniel 2? See, my, it's all in Aramaic, not Hebrew. From Daniel 2 to 7 is in, in the Gentile language of the day, the Aramaic, not the Hebrew. Miry clay is clay made from mire or dust. It's very brittle. When you get to Daniel, Daniel chapter 2, verse 43, I remember I must have read this hundreds of times over 30 years and never noticed what it said. Shame on me. And Daniel's interpreting this vision. He says, Whereas thou sawest the iron mixed with miry clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men. Whoops. Wait a minute. What did he say? See, the they, it's a person. The clay represents some kind of people. They, it's miry clay. They, just switches to a personal pronoun, shall mingle themselves with the seed of men. In order to mingle with the seed of men, they have to be something other than the seed of men. Or does, it's, I have had this checked by experts. That's what the Hebrew requires. Whatever they are, they're not the seed of men. What are they? I don't know. Are they Nephilim? Possibly. Are they genetically engineered clones? Possibly. But whatever they are, they apparently are a political constituency that is substantial in the scheme of things here. Whereas thou sawest the iron mixed with miry clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men, but they shall not cleave to one another, even as iron is not mixed with the, miry, with the clay. And he goes on. Mingle themselves with the seed of men. Interesting phrase. See, there is going to be restraint. We all know about the restraint are being removed. The mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now hindereth will hinder until he be taken out of the way, and then shall the wicked one be revealed. That's this we often call him the Antichrist, whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power. Wow. All power and signs and lying wonders. Be prepared for this political leader to do miracles, powered by Satan. We're not ready for that. Second Thessalonians 2 is where we're drawing from here. Where does the Antichrist come from? Everybody misses this. 
He's in Revelation 13. Wait a minute. In Revelation 11, he's where he's first introduced in Revelation. Verse 7. And when they shall have finished, speaking of the two witnesses, when they have finished their testimony, the beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them and shall overcome them and kill them. That's, of course, the Antichrist finally kills two witnesses. Where does he come out of? Out of the abuso. In Revelation 17, the beast that thou sawest was and is not and shall ascend out of the bottom of the split and go into perdition and they that dwell on the earth shall wonder whose names were not written in the book of life and he goes on. Because they received not the love of the truth that they might be saved for this cause God will send them a strong delusion that they should believe the lie. Not a lie, the lie. Well, I, I want to just close with, uh, get, then we'll get back to finishing up the last few verses of the chapter. We've done all this in the first four verses. I appreciate that. But what I want you to do tonight, when you get some time, I want you to read the second psalm, and I want you to diagram who's speaking. There are three people talking to each other. The psalm reads, it opens up as follows. Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves, and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying... Let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. And he goes on. If you diagram this, you'll discover it's a, it's a discussion among the Trinity. Part of this is the Father, part of the Son, part of the Holy Spirit. And we take that little short psalm, diagram it, and figure out who's saying what to whom. But this is talking about what I consider the most absurd war imaginable. All wars are bad, of course. Some are justified, some aren't. But the most ridiculous war is this one that it's talking about. I can understand people not believing in God. I can understand people uh, being disobedient to God. What I cannot imagine in my mind is the world knowingly taking up arms against God. But that's what's going to happen. Why do the heathen rage the people imagine a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against who? Against the Lord and his anointed. That's what the word Christ means. It's an anointed one. It's saying, let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords. They're going to throw off the shackles of God? Really? The rest of the psalm deals with it. And I'll let you, I invite you to go take a look at it. Well, let's get back to finish up the chapter. The rest of the is, God saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was evil, only evil continually. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on earth, and it grieved him at his heart. And uh, this, of course, the word is uh, in, in repented is nacham, which is a, a knifeful form, which describes anthropologically as God having suffered a heart-rendering disappointment. Literally, it speaks of taking a deep breath in extreme pain. That's what it really means. So you say, God can't repent. You know, we use that word in a different sense. It's, it's an anthropomorphism to how God felt. He was, God was hurt. It grieved him at his heart. The Lord said, I will destroy man from for, uh, whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast and creeping thing, and the fowls of the air, for it repenteth me that I have made them. But, oh, important word. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Boy, are we grateful for that. Every one of us are a descendant of Noah. Did you know that? Of course, yeah, okay. These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man, perfect in his generations, and Noah walked with God. And uh, perfect really means upright, if you will. But again, we talked about that. Noah begot three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. The earth also was uh, corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence, and God looked upon the earth, and behold, it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted his way upon the earth. By the way, that verse also shreds the Sethite theory. No good guys. No one deserving. Genesis 13, God said unto Noah, The end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them. And behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Make thee an ark of gopher wood. Room shalt thou make in the ark, and shall pitch it within and without with pitch. Now the word ark here is tiba. Uh, it came down from the Latin arca is where we get the word ark. It's a chest or coffer. The word for ark and the ark of the covenant is a different word in the Hebrew. But obviously it's what you and I would properly call a barge. It's not a boat. It's not powered. It's just a barge. But, but anyway, what's, and it's, by the way, it's been studied like mad by naval architects. And I, the, the, the proportions are ideal, it turns out, strangely. I want you to notice now, and we'll talk about it more next time, 
Thou shalt pitch it within and without with pitch. If you make a boat, where do you pitch the boat? Where do you make the? Where do you put the waterproofing? Yeah, but this is on both sides, isn't it? Why do you suppose that it's pitched within and without? I'm going to suggest to you, and we'll develop it next time as we get into the ark itself, that it's designed to preserve it. That ark, I believe, has been miraculously hidden, and it may be on the verge of being discovered. I don't think it's in what we call Mount Ararat. It's somewhere else, but that's, neither, that's another. We'll talk about that next time. But the point is, it's designed to be preserved because I believe it's going to be discovered and it's going to serve as a testimony to an unbelieving world of the coming judgment. Again, not a flood this time, but um, we'll see. God goes on to give him more details. He says, this is the fashion which thou shalt make it. The length of the ark shall be 300 cubits. For our purposes here, assume that a cubit is about 18 inches. It could be as large as 25 inches. But let's just, we, a foot and a half is an easy approximation for us. The length of the ark shall be 300 cubits, the breadth of it 50 cubits, and the height of it 30 cubits. And a window shalt thou make to the ark, and in a cubit shalt thou finish it above and the door of the ark shall be set in the side thereof with the lower, second, and third stories shalt thou make it. Don't picture a little square window. Picture a slot like a transom across the whole length of it. You follow me? To let air, light in and air and so forth. That's the way it's generally rendered by most people who have studied this. And behold, I, even I, do bring a flood of waters upon the earth to destroy all flesh wherein is the breath of life from under heaven and everything that is in the earth shall die. And with thee will I establish my covenant. And thou shalt come into the ark, thou and thy sons and thy wife and thy sons' wives with thee. And of every living thing, of all flesh, two of every sort shalt thou bring into the ark to keep them alive with thee. They shall be male and female. Of fowls after their kind and of cattle after their kind and every creeping thing of the earth after his kind, two of every sort shalt shall come unto thee and keep them alive. Now we're going to discover the first two verses of the next chapter is going to mend that with an addition because he's going to add 14. Because, he's actually going to add a dozen more because you can take the two and add seven of each. There's going to be seven, seven of each, seven male, seven female. You with me? For, for those that are clean. We'll talk about that next time. And thou shalt take unto thee of all food that is eaten and thou shalt gather it to thee and it shall be for food for thee and for them. Thus did Noah, according to all that God commanded him, so did he. That sounds so glib. Can you imagine building something the size that's larger of the Titanic in your front driveway and spend 120 years of having your neighbors make fun of you? They didn't know what rain was. There was no such thing as rain in those days. We forget that. There was no rain. Rain came later. We'll take a quick look at the chapter 7, and then we'll tie it off here tonight. The Lord said unto Noah, this is the opening of the next chapter, Come thou and all thy house into the ark, for thee have I seen righteous before me in this generation. Of every clean beast shalt thou take to thee by sevens, the male and his female, and of beasts that are not clean by two, the male and his female. Of fowls also of the air by sevens, the male and the female, to keep seed alive upon the face of the earth. The question you're going to examine between now and next week is how did Noah know what was clean and unclean? Those are definitions that don't show up until Moses under the law, which is generations later, right? So next time, we're going to talk about the flood of Noah. Was it local or was it really worldwide? Big debate. There are guys like Hugh Ross and others that don't believe in a, in a universal flood. They claim to be Bible believers. But they have some word games they play. But they, there are people, anyway, there are people that don't believe it was a worldwide flood. I'll explain what we think and why when it comes. Was the ark big enough to hold all the animals required? We'll talk about that. But more importantly, perhaps, how is the ark relevant prophetically? God puts it on one of the highest mountains, so high in altitude they have to leave it there. It's too thin to live. So when they leave the ark... They go down, 
They can't cannibalize it to make cabins and stuff. It's on top of, what, 14,000 feet or wherever it is. Um, I'm going to suggest that it has another role, yet future. I want you for next time to read chapters 7, 8, and 9, because we'll try to take all three to make up a little for the time I took to hammer home this one. Um, the angel view of Genesis 6. I'm, I'm trying to emphasize it only because you're going to discover that it, its understanding will be essential to understand what really happened in the book of Joshua, what really happened uh, all through the scripture, and what Isaiah means when he talks about the Rephaim that they're not eligible for resurrection, and so forth. There's all, it, it, it pervades the whole scripture. And especially, you have no ability to understand what Jesus meant when he says, as the days of Noah were, so shall the days of the coming of the Son of Man be. What on earth did he mean? Let's stand for a closing word of prayer. Let's bow our hearts. Father, we do praise you. We thank you, Father, for your word. We thank you that you've seen fit to reveal to us not only what you've done, but what you're going to do. We thank you, Father, for your precious, precious word. We do pray, Father, that you would open our hearts and lives to your word. We pray, Father, that through your Holy Spirit you would instruct us, you'd highlight to us that which you'd have us carry away from these passages. But above all, Father, we would ask that you would reignite in each of us a new hunger, a new passion for your word, that we each might continue to grow in grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, that we each might be more fruitful stewards of the opportunities that are before us. We thank you, Father, as we commit ourselves into your hands without any reservation. In the name of Yeshua our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. strange topic tonight. We're going to talk about UFOs. Now, this is an area that uh, most people tend to relegate to the demented or incompetent or fringe type people. And yet, uh, the entertainment industry, of course, has uh, picked up on this with the uh, 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 crop circle thing called Signs, which may, many of uh, you may have seen. And also, uh, Steven Spielberg did a mini-series called Taken focusing on the abductions and so forth. And uh, while these things are interesting entertainment, they are replete, of course, with all kinds of misinformation and, and uh, legends and uh, half-truths that get mingled with facts so that it's uh, really just entertainment. But one of the things you and I have to face is, uh, what is the real reality here? Is this just a bunch of nonsense, a, a composite of hoaxes and, and pranks by various people through the years? Or is there something really going on? One of the things we want to explore a little tonight is, are the UFOs real? And if so, where are they from? What's their agenda? Are they friendly or hostile? And uh, more, most important, what does the Bible say about them? So we're going to explore that tonight as we go forth on our exp exploration of UFOs and this strange term, the Nephilim. Uh, what is that all about? But before we start, since we are dealing with a very, very complicated area, an area where many of us have already formed opinions, let me remind you of the, there's a principle. According to Edmund Spencer, he, he articulated this, there's a principle which is a bar against all information. It's proof against all argument. And it's something which cannot fail to keep man in everlasting ignorance. And that principle is condemnation before investigation. So one of our challenges as we go into this very complicated topic is to set aside our prejudices and presuppositions and let's see what we can uh, find.
find out. Now, the same idea is not only uh, articulated by Edmund Spencer, but it also is in our uh, uh, collection of Proverbs by Solomon, who reminds us that he that answereth the matter before he heareth it, it is a folly and a shame unto him. So one of our challenges tonight is sort of set aside what we think we may have heard or what, we, what our basic prejudices are, and let's see what we can find out that might be new. Now, many of us, of course, have seen photographs, many of which are hoaxes, contrived, and so forth. Uh, there are many of these in the literature. I'm sure you've seen all kinds. Uh, the problem is, is that not all of them are. It may surprise you to learn that there are over 3,000 authenticated photographs in the classified community that are uh, authenticated. So what's really going on here? See, the, the problem we have in researching this area is there is so much that's uncorroborated. There's a lot of deliberate disinformation and certainly a lot of data which is unreliable. And uh, the problem is when you strip away the hoaxes and you strip away the nonsense and you set aside the uncorroborated, there still is too much to ignore that is substantiated that involves multiple reliable witnesses, including multiple radar sightings. And uh, radars generally don't have hallucinations. And uh, this idea of being plotted simultaneously on multiple radars is something that should get our attention. And uh, now, give you one example Back in, on June 18th of 1997, there was a strange vehicle that appeared over Phoenix, Arizona, in fact, went over most of the state. At about 30 miles an hour, which is very slow for an airborne vehicle, there were some that said they felt they could have hit it with a, a, a ball that seemed that close as it went over. And it created quite a stir. And uh, on March 13th, there were, there were uh, uh, sightings uh, all the way uh, from Casa Grande and Chandler, all the way up through uh, the northern part of the state, Prescott and so forth. So there was a, it wasn't just a local phenomenon, and uh, it created quite a stir. Now, the governor of Arizona made a big mistake by treating a press conference the following morning lightly as humor. And it didn't go over very well because people were upset because they were getting stonewalled by the government. Uh, even though there were denials by the Air Force, they saw the fighter jets uh, 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 sorry after them and so on, so it, it created quite a stir. It wasn't picked up in the national media. It was picked up, of course, substantially in the local media, that is, in the state of Arizona. And uh, one of the things that's strange about this is that it happened in March of, of, uh, uh, of uh, 1997. It didn't show up until June 18th. And for, what's, what's strange to, to me is not just the event that happened in March, but there was no word about it in the national media. But then for some reason, some, no obvious reason, on uh, June 18th, it was on the front page of USA Today. That's where this picture came from. It was on the, uh, NBC, CBS, CNN, all the major networks had this brief comment about what happened, what was puzzling about it. It didn't happen on June 18th. It happened back in March. And I haven't been able to determine what triggered the news media to make it a big event at that time. It's one thing it does demonstrate is how the news is managed, because all the networks pick it up at the same time uh, for no ostensible reason. Um, but as we talk about these kinds of things, sooner or later, we have to focus on the Roswell incident. And uh, many of you realize that approximately July 4th, a few days following maybe, some object, that's in 1947, some object landed near Roswell, New Mexico, and uh, Sheriff George Wilcox contacted the Roswell Army Airfield um, regarding wreckage that was discovered on Max Brazel's ranch or in, in that area. The Army seals off the area and confiscates everything that was there, and uh, on, on the 8th of July, uh, Colonel William Blanchard, who was commander of the 509th Bomb Group, that was our primary atomic bomb group in those days, uh, he issued an official press release stating that the wreckage of a crashed disk had been recovered. Now this press release went out early enough on July 8th to be picked up by 30 newspapers across the country. And so it is. And this is a, a, a snapshot of uh, what it looks like. The RAAF uh, captures flying saucer on ranch in Roswell region and so forth. And no details of flying disc are revealed, et cetera, et cetera. 
Except within hours, something very strange happens. A second press release, which had tried to rescind the first one, was issued from the office of Brigadier General Roger Ramey, who was commander of the 8th Air Force. At, and it, uh, he resides at Fort Worth uh, Army Airfield in Texas, which is about 400 miles away from the incident. But within hours, General Ramey issues a countermanding release, and he claimed that Colonel Blanchard and the officers of the 509th uh, at Roswell had made an unbelievably foolish mistake that somehow they incorrectly identified a weather balloon and its radar reflector as the wreckage of a crashed disk. Now, frankly, everyone that heard this, that thought about it a little bit, realized that was just a very uh, uh, contrived cover story. And uh, 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 it, he, this press release that, in effect, hit the next day by General Ramey uh, caused, you know, it was in effect a denial, uh, did not explain why they confiscated everything, why the whole subject has been classified to this day. And uh, now that, what that really did, this absurd cover story, frankly, just fueled the uh, 50 years, the intervening 50 years of conjectures and all kinds of anecdotal testimonies of people who were involved peripherally. All kinds of stories have been echoing uh, uh, throughout the, the, uh, this half century that's transpired since uh, July of 1947. And the stories typically uh, maintain that there were four alien occupants of this uh, 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 disk, that w for three of them were dead, one was still alive, all these presumably were taken off to the, uh, uh, the never never land of military security and there's all kinds of stories that are too preposterous to really accept and yet uh, it continues. The great mystery about, uh, uh, well, every, when I travel, one of the most often questions I get is what really happened at Roswell? Well, we don't really know what happened at Roswell. It's been classified, and we'll talk about that a little bit. We do know something that happened nine months after the Roswell incident. Al Gore was born. <laughs> and, <laughs> and it turns out he really was. The, the Roswell incident occurred uh, nominally about July, uh, the days following July 4th in 1947. His birthday is March 31st of 1948, and that makes it a cute quip because every audience has always seemed to enjoy that kind of a crack. And obviously, I'm not being serious uh, uh, that there's a linkage, really. But um, in any case, there is one reason I want to dwell on this a little bit, because for 50 years, people have conjectured what really happened there, and the Air Force has contrived one thin cover story after another over the years, each one sillier than the first, each one easily refuted by anyone that does a little homework. So you wonder, why is this thing still classified? Several presidents and uh, half a dozen congressmen have tried to crack the security surrounding Roswell to no avail. What could have happened there that is still to this day regarded as an item of national security? And uh, now, f interestingly enough, just in the last uh, few months, there appears that we now have what some people would call the smoking gun. There is some tangible evidence that's finally emerged that there was a crash of some kind and it did have victims of some sort. You see, when General Ramey at Fort Worth issued that cover story, there were, the press was present and many pictures were taken. And James Bond Johnson of the Fort Worth Star-Telegram was among them. And on July 8th, he took a photograph, which a number of the photographs happened to show General Ramey clutching a sheaf of papers in his hand that apparently was a communique to Washington, D.C., and he happened to have it in his hand while he was going through this explanation and, and demonstrating that this really was a weather balloon. They had some props there that they showed and so forth. Well, it turns out that was in July 47. Since 1947, we've made a lot of progress in digital imaging technology. And this sheaf of paper that was uh, uh, photographed was analyzed with a, dig a, a, a digital photo scanner and enlarged and, and enhanced the words printed on the folded piece of paper, and then using a program for digital enhancement and analysis, it's now been reported on Associated Press on November 22nd of the year 2002 uh, that uh, David Rudiak 
was able to identify several key phrases on that sheaf of paper that General Ramey was clutching during that press conference. There's a phrase, the victims of the wreck, and also the phrase, in the disk they will ship. Lots of other words that were uh, hard, to, you know, more conjectural is what they said, but the point is here's a communication in his hand going to Washington that speaks of victims of the wreck and speaks of a disk that they're going to ship while he's covering the story that, that, that uh, Colonel uh, you know, Blanchard was all mixed up, this is just a weather balloon. So finally, the, the UFO researchers have something tangible to go on, because up till now, it's been a spooky thing. Let's shift a little bit from 47 to July 19th through the 26th, about a week, in 1952. I happen to remember this vividly, because in June 30th of 1952, I was entering the United States Naval Academy, so I was a plebe, uh, or I should say, yeah, a plebe at, um, at Annapolis uh, when this was in the papers and much talked about at the time. It turns out a number of UFOs harassed Washington National Airport, which in those days was the only airport there. We didn't have Dulles. This is before Dulles. And uh, also Andrews Air Force Base. So badly they had to shut down the air traffic. And this went on and off and on for a week. And it was in the papers because every time the Air Force would alert jets to investigate what these things were, they would disappear. As soon as the jets landed, they came back. And uh, uh, fiery objects overrun jets over Capitol in the Washington Post. These are headlines from that period. Now, one of the things, there again, they never really explained it. They issued some cover stories, but the truth of the matter is they didn't know what it was, and it wasn't just an incident one night. It went off and on for a better part of a week. Again, a mis it created a problem just in blocking all the phone traffic because everybody's calling what's going on and so forth, and, and so something real was happening. Because you're talking here multiple radars. This isn't some you know, impressionable, uh, unprofessional observer. This was uh, the Air Force Air Controllers at the Washington National and Andrews Air Force Base. And uh, never explained, at least not to the public. 1993, there, you know, by the way, there are thousands of these things to select from. I've just picked a few that seem representative. Yeah, over in Mexico City in 1993, the population by the thousands were uh, upset and disturbed by what went on. Went on. Uh, Seoul, South Korea, November 23rd of 1996, CNN and Reuters reported a huge cigar-shaped UFO that was televised for 10 minutes on national television. You know, when we talk about witnesses, there's all kinds of people, many very reliable professionals that have contributed to this background, but the ones that you and I would tend to presume would be the most reputable, most trained, and most uh, competent in this area would be our astronauts. You think they know something about it. Do you realize that 13 of them have gone on record uh, of seeing UFOs while they were doing their missions? Uh, Ed Mitchell, Apollo 14. April 1996, and was, this was on uh, Dateline NBC. He said, NASA <clears throat> is covering up what really happened at Roswell, New Mexico. See, this isn't just the presumption of some journalists or the, or the tabloids at the check, you know, checkout stands in the market. These, <laughs> these are serious people saying that something is being covered up. Astronaut Gordon Cooper has made many talks. On May 15th of 1963, he did the 22-orbit Mercury capsule. He saw a green UFO, which was also, at the same time he saw it, tracked by, our, uh, by the radar in Australia. It corroborated this. And he's testified before the United Nations that UFOs are visiting this planet. And uh, in May 1996, he said, we are being visited by aliens. So he said, he's spoken a lot about this, so much so that some people tend to write him off. James Lovell, Frank Borman, <coughs> Borman excuse me. Gemini 7, December 1965, on the second orbit of their two-week flight, they saw a UFO. Gemini Control presumed it was the stage of their own Titan booster, but they indicated that they had both the booster and the UFO in sight, so that doesn't quite jive. Walter Schirra, these are all familiar names to most of us. Mercury 8, 1968, he was the first guy to use the term Santa Claus to indicate UFOs are near the space capsule. And uh, so this is, uh, uh, was about December, so everybody thought that this was just a cute quip, but it was a code word. And this was, it was later, uh, in 1979, Maurice Chatelain, the chief of NASA communications, confirmed that the Santa Claus phrase was a prearranged code word to deal with the UFOs without alarming the public. 
and uh, Neil Armstrong, Buzz Aldrin. These familiar names to you? Are these guys competent? On Apollo 11, July 21st, 1969, both apparently saw lights in and on a crater, and there, there are unconfirmed reports that there were other spacecraft there. Some of this is classified, gets classified quickly, so we're, tra we're treading on dangerous ground. But they have said two large objects were watching them. And Armstrong is quoted in some reports of a CIA cover-up. Now, those reports get uh, squelched, of course, so you, it's hard to separate what was just you know, urban legend and what really happened. But if you go to Ed White, James McDivitt, James Lovell, Borman, Shira, Gordon Cooper, these guys are all, have all reported UFOs. Neil Armstrong, Apollo 11, Buzz Aldrin, Apollo 11, Ned Mitchell, Apollo 14, and on it goes. And uh, one of the most interesting ones is John Blaha. He was a veteran of five space shuttle missions. He also was a relatively recent resident of the Russian Mir space station this a few years ago. Uh, March 24th of 1989, an amateur radio operator picked up an exer uh, a, a intercept. He uh, said, uh, Houston, this is Discovery. We still have the alien spacecraft under observation. And uh, very impressive to listen to that soundtrack and hear if the familiar voice uh, say these rather strange things. So UFOs, we could go on and on. The main point I'm trying to do at this point, just indicate there are some people that you would consider competent and reliable in multiple names that are reporting these things are real. And I would not attribute all of these to hallucinations or being impressionable or what have you. In fact, if you start looking into this area as an area of research, you'll find it extremely difficult because there are 6,000 professional publications in English alone that deal with this. There are 2,200 foreign publications, 1,350 UFO-related periodicals. And some of these, if you look at the books in the library, there are over 700 books that deal with UFOs just in the period from the 17th century to the First World War. Excuse me, the Second World War, from 1650 to about 1945. There are over 300 books prior to the 17th century that deal with UFOs in the ancient times. So what on earth is this all about? You know, they've done polls. Do you realize that 57% of Americans, according to the polls, believe in UFOs? That doesn't make them real, but it says there's some phenomenology that must be real, even just perceptions. 15% of Americans believe they have seen a UFO. How many of you in the audience have seen a UFO at one time? Okay, we're not going to take names. I just care. Oh, good, okay. <laughs> Here's the shocking one. This blew me away when I first ran into it. The, the, somewhere between one and three percent, various, various polls agree, somewhere between one and three percent of Americans claim that they have had an abduction experience. That's over five million people, or in that neighborhood. Not a few thousand deranged people, not a few you know, disaffected. This is, uh, we'll talk a little more about this. This is a, this is a very, very disturbing phenomenon in the, cons in the counseling uh, profession. Now, part of the problem of the UFOs is they have some paradoxical behavior. On the one hand, they're seen by multiple competent witnesses. They are plotted on radar, sometimes multiple radars simultaneously. They leave tangible traces on the ground sometimes radiation, evidence of burning, and other things. So they are apparently real in the sense of being physical, on the one hand. There are photographs. Sometimes they show up on photographs, sometimes they don't. But here's the problem. They do, while they seem to be tangible on the one hand, they exhibit behavior that can't possibly be physical. They can go in excess of 6,000 miles per hour without sonic boom. So what on earth does that mean? I'd like to know how they do that trick. They've been plotted making right angle turns at over 16,000 miles an hour. That defies the laws of physics. That's a, now the more, and, and the, perhaps the most disturbing thing of all, they appear to have the ability to materialize and dematerialize without a trace. One of the great mysteries of the UFOs isn't seeing them, is trying to figure out where are they when you don't see them. Some people say, well, they're from another galaxy. There's lot, uh, most physicists will debunk that for lots of reasons. They seem to pose that way, but for lots of, if they came, you know, 
if they, there are that many coming from another galaxy, you'd think you'd sense the traffic. We'll come to back with some more reasonable uh, explanations, and you're going to discover. The, the two top researchers in the, in the last century, really, is uh, Jacques Vallée, France, and uh, J. Allen Hynek, the American. Now, J. Allen Hynek was uh, head of astronomy at, at Cornell, and he set out to debunk this nonsense about UFOs, and he became one of the most ardent, competent, balanced researchers in the trade. J. Allen Hynek, he, he died a few years ago. Uh, uh, those of you that saw the movie Close Encounters of the Third Kind, whether you realize or not, saw J. Allen Hynek because he, he was in the crowd. Uh, I was on the board in those days with Alan Adler from Columbia, and, and uh, they had him as just a gesture appear in some of the scenes, just as, a, as an extra. And uh, uh, the lacum of that, uh, of that piece of fiction, of course, was patterned after Jacques Vallée, the Frenchman. Both of these respected researchers came to the conclusion that they're not intergalactic for lots of physics. There are a lot of physical, uh, physics rebuttals to that conjecture. They both argued that these things are demonic, their term. They've written many, many books. You can uh, check them out. These are not uh, uh, religious people. They're not people with any kind of personal agenda. But they came to the conclusion that these things, on the one hand, and, and by the way, we, we take for granted that we strip away the nonsense and the hoaxes, set that aside. There's tens of thousands of files you have to wallow through. When you, when you cut through all that, there's still a core group, a substantial core group of real events that need explanation. And uh, so on the one hand, they exhibit physical properties. On the one hand, on the other hand, they also violate all physical laws. And so the conclusion from that both J. Allen Hynek and Jacques Vallée and others have come to is that they're hyperdimensional, that somehow they come from another dimension periodically. That causes us now to stand back a little bit and, and do a little tutorial on uh, hyperspaces. And, uh, uh, and, and we're going to get into uh, why we feel that the Bible is an authenticated message of extraterrestrial origin in the first place. So let's talk a little about hyperspaces. There are only two kinds of, a hyperspace, by the way, just a term for a space of more than three dimensions. You and I are familiar with two-dimensional space. It's called a scratch pad or a, a, a photograph or a piece of paper as a two-dimensional representation of something, typically. Uh, three-dimensional space we're familiar with because we live in it and we also build models in three dimensions. We probably have a vague feeling of a fourth dimension called time. We don't get too comfortable with that unless you've done some special study, but we sort of acknowledge that reluctantly. Hyperspaces, frankly, is just the term used to study spaces of more than three dimensions. And we discover there's only two kinds of people that can really relate to hyperspaces. And that's mathematicians with special training and small children. Okay? Because they haven't, the, uh, their, their prejudice has been blindfolded, so to speak. Now, the one book that is second to the Bible in its publication, all of us know the Bible is the most uh, a popular book in the history of man, but the second to that would be Euclid, and that's where most of us have been taught in school, and most of us when we went to school had trigonometry or, or plane geometry, same subject in a sense. Uh, we all know that a triangle, if you add up the angles of a triangle, adds up, to, adds up to how much? Anyone? 180 degrees, you betcha. So if I have a 30, 60, 90, it adds up 180. If I have a 45, 45, 90, in fact, any triangle, if I add up the, the angles, it would add up to 180. Suppose, though, that my partner and I went out to a large field here, and we, and we very carefully laid out with a transit a very large triangle, and when we got back with our uh, figures, we added up the three angles, and it added up to more than 180 degrees. What would you conclude? That we'd messed up, huh? No, what, we've, what, we, what have we encountered? Anyone? The curvature of the Earth, exactly. See, if you take a course in navigation, one of the things that you'll have to get some background in is spherical trigonometry, where you can have a triangle with 90 degrees in each corner. And so, see, when, when we, this little rule that we all learned that a triangle, you know, a, 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 by, by implication, a plane triangle, a, a, a flat plane, adds up to 180 degrees, that's only true for a universe of two dimensions. So when you find that rule violated, it's a hint that you've encountered an additional dimension. And uh, so uh, if, uh, uh, Dr. Einstein made history with that insight. 
because he was grappling, of course, with the nature of, of space, and, and uh, he realized that length, mass, velocity, and time are relative to the velocity of the observer. Uh, in 1915, he generalized that, basically discovered that there's no distinction between time and space. And perhaps the most important thing from the th general theory of relativity, we, don't, we won't get in the math, of course, but it to, is to realize that time itself is a physical property. You and I do not live in three dimensions. We live in at least four. In fact, we now discover much more than that. But uh, this idea <coughs> that Einstein recognized as he grappled with the properties of space that there's a, an additional dimension required, and he went to four dimensions to resolve the time issue. And uh, his theory of relativity has been uh, uh, confirmed over 12 different methods to over 14 decimals. So it's no longer really a theory. Uh, it's 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 well accepted basis in uh, in certain fields of science. So when we go, be, we need to go beyond Euclid, which of course deals just with three dimensions. And uh, in June 10th of, 19, of 1854, the most important lecture in mathematics was given by George Riemann. He invented a thing called metric tensors. And uh, that tool that he developed proves to be one of the most profound tools um, in advanced physics. And it took uh, uh, over 50 years, in fact, over 60 years, for Dr. Einstein to use that tool to develop his four-dimensional space-time. And it's too bad that Einstein went to his death frustrated by not being able to solve certain problems, which if he had applied the technique going to five or more dimensions, they would have yielded. It took his successors to do that. Because in 1953, Kaluza and Klein both developed more than four-dimensional uh, models, which integrated light and supergravity uh, in, in, the, in a model. In 1963, 10 years later, Yang and Mills both developed what they call Yang-Mills fields, which reconcile electromagnetic and nuclear forces that physicists are pursuing some way to integrate all that we know about the physical universe into a common model. And uh, so the, in... Uh, in uh, as early as eight, 1984, and it's still a current conjecture because there's a lot still problems with it, but uh, scientists now generally believe that you and I live not in three or four or five, but in ten dimensions. And uh, they, 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 you, if you read in this area, you'll encounter su uh, super strings and such, and I won't get, we have briefing packs on this for those that want to get into it more. The point being, we need to understand that the three dimensions you and I are familiar with are not all there is. There's more. Let's imagine you and I can't move up. It'd be futile for me to try to communicate four, five, six dimensions to us without, to get together without having more mathematical tools. But what we can do is we can go the other way, and it may stretch our horizons here a little bit. You and I are three-dimensional beings. Let's imagine a two-dimensional world. That would be as like a, a large tabletop or a large flat plane. Now, and let's imagine that two-dimensional world populated by two-dimensional people. You and I could come along and poke our finger through the plane of their existence. And what would they see? They would see a circle. They'd only see that which they could relate to in their universe. But if, we're, if we as a three-dimensional being are putting our finger through that uh, uh, two-dimensional universe to the two-dimensional people in the two-dimensional universe, they would simply see a circle. Well, in fact, let's imagine that a ball fell through that two-dimensional universe. To the two-dimensional observer in that two-dimensional universe, he'd see from nothing to a point, it would be, it'd grow to a large circle, and then it would shrink back to a point and disappear. He wouldn't be able to relate to what happened because he doesn't have the, the insight of, of that third dimension. You with me so far? Now, if you had some other kind of a shape, say a tumbling cube, it also would go through and it would take odd shapes as it passed through and then disappear. So one of the problems we have, suppose, if, suppose you and I are going to try to communicate a three-dimensional object to that two-dimensional world. How would we go about it? Well, there's a couple of ways. One would be to do what, what an architect would call projection. For example, if we had a cube, we could, in effect, shine a light that would give you a profile of that in two dimensions. And you discover very quickly that that works, but it's not too useful in letting the two-dimensional person understand a three-dimensional cube. So there's another way you could do it. You could take a, a three-dimensional cube, and you could unravel it. You could take it and just unfold it, 
and lay it out, and that would be a way to communicate to this two-dimensional person what this three-dimensional cube is like. But you'd quickly discover as you tried to do that, his understanding is likely to be incomplete. You say, Chuck, what do you, what's all this got to do with anything? Well, <clears throat> let's talk about a four-dimensional cube. That's called in mathematics a Hinton cube, and uh, there are such things. Um, the, on, the only place I know of it, that's called a tesseract. That's an unraveled Hinton cube. This is a four-dimensional cube unraveled into three dimensions. You say, gee, what, what good is that? There's only one place I know of where this has actually been used constructively. And amazingly enough, it was by Salvador Dali. I never realized what a sophisticated mathematician he was, but in, in uh, his Corpus Christi painting, he actually has Christ on a four-dimensional cube as a cross, in, implying his mastery over time as well as space. And uh, I imagine there's probably not one observer in a hundred that really understands the sophistication that Salvador Dali was demonstrating by this piece of abstract art. But that's a Hinton cube or a tesseract, and that's the end. But anyway, let's get back to hyperspaces then. The main point I want to get across, you and I live in three spatial dimensions, and that time is a physical property. That's very important to us in our ministry because we know that the Bible is an integrated message, 66 books penned by 40 guys over thousands of years, and yet it's integrated, and not just thematically. The very design of the text itself evidences uh, integration. But what's mysterious about that, that integration also implies that the origin of that message is from outside the dimensionality of time because of the nature of its structure, its use of, uh, of writing history be before it happens and so forth. So that's very important. Now in particle physics, uh, they talk about 10 dimensional strings as the nature of our universe. What fascinates me about that is that that's exactly what two Hebrew scholars back in the 13th century, excuse me, 12th century, predicted just from their study of Genesis 1 is that we live in 10 dimensions, four, are, four dimensions are knowable, and six are not knowable, to use their jargon. But in any case, the, the suggestion, it's the only one that we've encountered that really can reconcile what we think we know, is that the UFOs apparently are hyperdimensional. They apparently can enter our dimensional under certain conditions for certain periods of time. And uh, so let's see. Uh, now there's another aspect I'd like to touch upon about the, the, the whole UFO area. And getting back to the Roswell thing, why on earth is Roswell still classified? Why can't the American public or the world public be informed about what's really going on? It's all, it's all tightly classified. Well, back in 1984, an event occurred that uh, deserves some comment. In 1984, several documents emerged within the UFO community. One was a briefing addressed to President-elect Dwight D. Eisenhower by Re uh, Rear Admiral Roscoe Hill Hillencutter, and it was dated 18 November 1952. And there was also a special classified executive order signed by Harry S. Truman. To the Secretary of Defense in those days was James Forrestal. It was dated 24 September 1947. And his letter apparently authorized him to establish a board of suitably qualified persons to be answerable directly and only to the President. And the code name for this august group of appointees was Majestic 12. That was the code name. And these documents, all kinds of documents show up, uh, CIA documents and other things, including this memo that signed by Harry Truman uh, uh, establishing this, this august group. Now, who were, these, who were this these group called Majestic 12? Well, one, of course, was James, Secretary of Defense James Forrestal. Rear Admiral Roscoe Hillencotter, who was prominent in those days, Dr. Vannevar Bush, who was probably the most famous scientist uh, of the period, General Nathan Twining, head of the Air Force, General Hoyt Vandenberg, Robert, General Robert Montague, and a number of civilians that you may or not have heard of, Dr. Detlef Bronk, Dr. Jerome Hunsucker, Mr. Sidney Sowers, Mr. Gordon Gray, and uh, Dr. Lloyd Berkner, and one guy we will talk about a little bit is Dr. Donald Menzel. And uh, these were, uh, it, it, when Forrestal died, by the way, in 49, General uh, 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 Walker Smith replaced him. But these 12 people apparently were known in the classified community, it would seem, as Majestic 12. Well, 
These are interesting people. You see, uh, of these 12, of 12 people, it was Secretary of Defense, of course, three of these people were the first three directors of the Central CIA, the Central Intelligence Agency. Actually, at, uh, the, the Director of Central Intelligence, that was a successor to the Office of Strategic Services, the OSS, which later became the CIA. Five of these people were top scientists in aviation, research and development, and astronomy. All of these people held the highest security clearances anyway. Let's talk a little bit about Admiral Hillencutter. He was not, turns out, he was not simply a Navy man. And by the way, I want to mention something. Uh, a lot of people have heard about Majestic 12. And a lot of people also understand that it's been all debunked. But we're indebted to a very, very patient, thorough, diligent researcher by the name of Stanton Friedman, who published a book on this. And what he did, uh, well, uh, uh, he, he developed dossiers, spent 20 years developing dossiers on each of the 12 to try to understand as much as he could about their personal lives. Rear Admiral Hillencotter was not simply a Navy man. He was the first director of the CIA, which was also established, inter interestingly enough, in September of 1947, just months after the Roswell incident. He retired from the U.S. Navy in 57 and soon was appointed the, on the board of governors of NICAP, which was considered the most influential UFO organization in the 50s and 60s. Dr. Vannevar Bush, this is a name you probably heard. He's a world-renowned research scientist. He was the head of MIT between the two world wars and head of the Office of Scientist and, uh, uh, Scientific Research and Development. He led the development of the atomic bomb, the proximity fuse, radar, and a hundred other high-tech uh, systems with military applications. See, that's why he's so well-known. He was also well-known for establishing a policy of compartmentalization of classified work. It was previously the style in research labs to give people a lot of freedom of movement. And he was the one that saw the need for compartmentalizing, letting scientists uh, have only the information they need to know so that they could control the, the, the uh, 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 transit of information uh, within the organization. So this whole idea of, we're going to talk about compartmentalization here shortly. Well, this whole MJ-12 there, there are two kinds of people, those that have never heard of MJ-12, and those that know that it's just, uh, been, it was just a hoax. You see, somebody noticed that the, apparently that the typewriter that was used to type the Truman Executive Order of 1947 was deemed a Smith Corona model that had not been manufactured until 1963. So you start to smell a hoax, if that's true. The signature on the, uh, a memor <coughs> excuse me. the signature on the memorandum had apparently been photocopied from an unrelated letter that Truman wrote to Vannevar Bush back, uh, uh, written in uh, 1st of October of 1947. So you get the impression this thing was just a hoax. There are other anomalies that were noted and published in various media. So it quickly, within the UFO community, in just a few years, it was recognized by everyone that these documents were just fakes. And so most people either never heard of MG-12 or they, quote, know, close quote, that it was just a, a very elaborate hoax. Until Friedman comes along. Stanton Friedman, he was a nuclear physicist. He spent over a decade painstakingly probing 15 libraries and archives and he now has cast significant doubts about the doubters. He has refuted most of the documentation quibbles that were raised by the skeptics, but more importantly, he compiled detailed dossiers on each of the 12, and he's made some intriguing discoveries. See, by collecting the details on each one, some very interesting corroborations have emerged, and these are all published in his book, uh, Top Secret Magic, uh, in 1996. Let's take General Nathan Twining as an example. He had been scheduled to fly to Seattle on July 16th of 1947 to review the new B-50 bomber that was being built by Boeing at that time, and also to do some fishing with some old friends. So that was all scheduled for some time. Suddenly, General Twining canceled his Seattle trip and headed for New Mexico on July 7th. This is billed as just a routine inspection, but that doesn't jibe with the apparent urgency to upset all these other long laid plans for no apparent uh, specific reason. It's also interesting that on July 9th, President Truman met with New Mexico Senator Chavez um, uh, with no reason given. So you get the feeling behind these calendar entries there's something going on. Another interesting guy is Donald Menzel. He apparently, Friedman discovers, had a, led a double life. 
as a UFO debunker and a distinguished astronomer in public. He was a well-known astronomer. He also ran around poking holes at these UFO conjectures that were going on in those days. But it turns out he was also a linguist, a cryptographer, and a consultant to the National Security Agency and the Defense Intelligence Agency for more than 30 years, and this was not known in the public. There's something Stanton found out by doing his homework. He held a top secret ultra clearance, and none of this was known to the general public. So it's interesting, whoever contrived this hoax had a lot of inside information somehow. Now it's also provocative, as Dr. Menzel, he gave some technical explanations disputing some UFO incidents that often were not scientifically defendable, especially for a guy like him who is a competent technologist. So it it's, it's strongly suggestive that he had a private agenda of disinformation as part of his job. So at this point, it may be useful to highlight, again, this is a little tutorial, which I'm going to call the anatomy of secrecy. How do you make something secret within the government or military community? Well, the first thing, you can, de you can define the content of what's going on as secret or top secret or whatever level just is justified by the content of the material. If there's a contract, the content of the work can be classified secret, top secret, what have you. But let's assume you're really serious about making this especially secure. The other thing you can do is called compartmental, uh, compartmentalization. You can compartmentalize the project. And how do you do that? You make the existence of the contract classified. And uh, they, these are uh, usually in the intelligence community, and that's why they go by a nickname. They're called black programs from the intelligence uh, side. Uh, these, are, these are great contracts to get because your competitors don't know they exist. So they're sole source, and uh, they're considered attractive uh, contracts. I, I have served as chairman of the board of f four different publicly traded defense contractors. And uh, uh, several of these were uh, companies that d had their primary commitments in deeply classified work and uh, obviously included compartmentalized programs. But I have to tell you, I was startled. At, I spent 30 years in the strategic community, both in the Department of Defense community directly and also, as I say, uh, on boards and, uh, uh, of, uh, of publicly traded defense contractors. And I have to tell you, it was, was late in that 30-year career that I discovered, much to my amazement, there is another level of security, and that's where you make the existence of the customer classified. And I was uh, in one of those pro projects, and uh, the, the, uh, it was a very, very strange meeting. We had a, uh, uh, our little company that uh, uh, was publicly traded, but not a large company, uh, was competing for a, a particular uh, procurement, and uh, the, the head of that particular division asked me, as chairman of the board and controlling shareholder, and uh, and uh, 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 so on, to, to 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 be president of the meeting, along with our banker, the vice president of uh, First Interstate Bank, uh, was there, and uh, as we in this conference room. Uh, Three guys come in with business cards and give us their business cards, high technology research associates or something like that, but quickly explain that that's just a cover and we're not surprised. We, that's what's known as a cutout, a, a, a shell corporation that they're using for uh, uh, you know, certain purposes. And, uh, and they explained to us that um, uh, we are, there are two, we're down to two companies, ours, which is a smaller company, and another large company, one of the two companies is going to get, this is like on a Wednesday or Thursday, on Monday, one of these companies will be phoned and get the contract. And we're in the running. Okay, that's exciting. Um, but then they explain that they're very embarrassed because we'll get a verbal okay on Monday if we, if we win. But we'll have to start work right away to make the timing, and they won't be able to get paperwork to us for maybe 60 or 90 days. They're, they're embarrassed, but it, just, it takes that long to get the kind of paperwork we need. And so the problem is we're going to have to start on a verbal go-ahead before we have paper. And the problem with that is, is that they looked at our financials and we weren't that financially strong to undertake that kind of a commitment. And so that's why they wanted a banker there. And so they said, would the, could the bank extend? We, I think we had a credit line in those days of I think four and a half million. It would take another million and a half to make us presentable for this purpose. And, uh, and, I, and so they asked the bank if the bank could increase our credit line for a million and a half. The banker very naturally said, you don't tell us who you are, and you won't tell us what, you know, what it's all about. The answer is no. And so we're at a stalemate, because as it said, we're not, we, we, we wouldn't be qualified. And uh, I turned to the 
first, vice president of First Interstate Bank, I says, you people have my personal financials. In those days I had money. That's before I got in my project with the Russians. But anyway, um, they took me down. But the point is, in those days I had a, a net worth. I says, you, you have a net worth. If I guaranteed the incremental loan, would the bank will go along with this? And he said, I can't. He says, he didn't have the authority, but we go downtown. He says, that they'd probably go along with that. So I turned to the customer. I says, if I can pull that off in the next 24 hours, would that suffice? And they said, sure. So that's exactly what we did. I went downtown the next morning to First Interstate Bank. We signed some papers. And I guaranteed an additional, an incremental million and a half on the existing four and a half million dollar loan on that Thursday or Friday, whatever it was. And that Monday, we did get a phone call. And we won this contract. And that was eight, it, it, it turned out to be the electronics for the B2. And uh, uh, it was um, 18 months later that that whole project got transferred to Northrop. But prior to that, it was in an in a organization whose existence is classified. And so it, was, it startled me to discover that there's a whole procedure. There are uh, 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 cost uh, rec recovery procedures. There are courts. There's all kinds of all the necessary infrastructure to make this all work is in place. And it's all uh, highly classified to protect even the existence of the customer. That's the third level, if you will. You follow me? Well. One of the things that I want to, when you start talking about this, with that kind of a structure, how do you also really protect something that you're trying to keep secret? And one of the things you can do is have an active disinformation strategy. You not only keep it secret, you publish things to keep people from understanding what it is, discredited or whatever else. And we did that, for example, in the Manhattan Project during World War II. The very existence of our atomic, atomic bomb project, the so-called Manhattan Project, was hidden under a whole bunch of other cover stories and pseudo-projects. You went through certain doors, there were projects going on that really had nothing to do with anything, they were just a cover to hide what was really going on. Active disinformation. And one of the things I personally suspect is that's exactly what they did with MJ-12. It's very possible that they surface documents that have flaws in them knowing that after a few months, few years, whatever, the diligence of researchers will discover that that couldn't have been that typewriter, that really isn't Truman's signature, whatever. So everybody knows that MJ-12 is just a big hoax. What a perfect cover. Ask anybody that's in this community about MJ-12, and they'll shrug it off right away. Oh, that's that, that hoax that surfaced in the 80s. Really. What a perfect cover. And obviously, if, uh, if I, I, I think it's real, I think it's continued. It obviously has gone under new names and so forth. But I suddenly began to realize that the debunking of MJ-12 may be very well. There's, there's a number of reasons I don't want to get into that caused me to suspect that that all was contrived. There have been some others like that, incidentally. So there's a continuing mystery. Why is somebody going to all this trouble to hide for example, the Roswell stuff from uh, after 56 years, whatever it is, 57 years. Two presidents, four congressmen failed to penetrate the security surrounding the UFO-related issues. That's strange. By the way, a Canadian embassy inquiry was rebuffed in Washington, D.C. with the disclosure that the topic of UFOs enjoys a classification higher than our most secret warheads, the W-88s. They made an inquiry and they got turned down, but they made a mistake when they turned it down because they disclosed the fact that what they were after, which is some UFO information, was classified more highly than our weapon systems. Why? And uh, so, now by the way, just as we have Roswell in the United States, in England they have the famous Rendlesham Forest incident. And this is kind of interesting. On December 26th and 27th, the day after and then the next day of, of Christmas, in 1980, next, there was, there, there, there's a forest that's right next to a, a, a U.S. air base and a Royal Air, uh, uh, air Base at, at Woodbridge in Suffolk, uh, England. And in that forest, twice, two evenings in a row, a UFO landed. And... Uh, it was seen two nights into succession. It was tracked on radar by many of the military sites around there. Many people were involved. They rolled out uh, what they call light alls. That's like a, 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 draw, a, a car drawn trailer that has bright lights for various outdoor projects. They, they had that all set up when they landed. It was apparently scheduled somehow. And this was reported 
by Deputy Base Commander Lieutenant Colonel Charles Halt in a memo that was classified on both sides of the Atlantic, but a copy did get leaked out. And uh, the, so just as we have our Roswell mystery, in England, they talk a lot about Reynolds and Forrest. What really happened there? There are lots of people involved, military, enlisted and others. So out of that have come all kinds of stories. Many of them are too afraid to even talk about it. Others that share incidents and they're very, just, just as they're bizarre tales about Roswell, there's even more bizarre tales about Reynolds and Forrest. Well, the good news is the UK government has announced last few months that the Reynoldsham file is going to be released. They're moving towards a Freedom of Information Act kind of posture, and apparently the Reynoldsham Forest files, which have only been seen by about 20 people up until the release, and uh, so that's so for, there's we're in we're moving into a day when some of these mysteries are going to be uh, revealed. Now another thing that comes up when you talk about these topics are crop circles, and uh, and this might be a good ch chance for the for our. TV people to change tapes if they want. So why don't I, let's take a five minute stretch break and let them collect themselves and we'll pick up crop circles and some subsequent things following, okay? Well, you can't talk about UFOs and that sort of thing without getting into the area of crop circles. And the recent movie Signs with uh, Mel Gibson is an example of that. It was a, a, a you know amalgam of, of urban legends. They used corn stalks. None of the crop circles have used corn stalks, incidentally, but that's trivial. The real thing is, what about these crop circles? Many of us have heard that they're just developed by pranksters. Pranks with planks is the way most people regard them. And indeed, that probably covers many of them. I think most of you can have seen various patterns that occur in crops, in, not just in England, by the way, all over the world. They have uh, showed up uh, uh, more and more in, with increasing, in fact, there are websites that just keep track of the various styles. They are in the thousands, by the way. These are just some representative shots of them. And uh, various patterns, uh, not all of them circular, by the way, but, uh, uh, and of course, uh, many people associate these with UFOs. Many of these patterns have there been observers claim there have been UFOs seen over the fields the, the, you know, the night before the crop circles are discovered, that sort of thing. So there seems to be, at least in the minds of many, an association between them. And, uh, but in 1991, two elderly artists, Doug Bauer and Dave Charlie, they came forward and uh, indicating, admitting that they had faked hundreds of these circles and they demonstrated their technique using ropes and planks uh, and, and, and tethers and so forth to, uh, to uh, do this. In fact, they did it under journalist supervision. In fact, in some of the TV specials, you can actually see time motion where they, they uh, uh, unveil how they pulled some of these off. And if that was just it, we would probably dismiss this as an incidental topic. But, um, uh, and it does appear, by the way, that there are many of these that have some form of craftsmanship that accounts for the thousands that appear throughout the world, not just in uh, Britain, in the United States too. But let me tell you frankly, that doesn't explain them all. There's also a group of scientists that have been studying this quite rigorously and are startled with what they find on some of these circles. There are articles in peer-reviewed scientific journals that have established that not all of these things are pranks with planks. For example, biophysicist William C. Levengood, he's of the Pinlandia Biophysical Laboratory in Michigan. Um, He's examined plants and soils from 250 crop formations, randomly selected from seven countries. And the samples and the controls of the handling of those samples were provided by the Massachusetts-based BLT research team directed by Nancy Talbot. Levengood, by the way, has published over 50 papers in scientific journals. And he's documented numerous changes in the plants and the formations, for example. Most dramatically, they found grossly elongated nodes, or like knuckles, along the stem that are apparently expulsion cavities caused by the heating of the internal moisture from exposure to intense bursts of radiation. The only way they can explain them. They've also taken seeds from the plants and germinated them in a lab 
it showed significant alterations in growth as compared to the control samples. And this has been published in the International Journal of European Societies of Plant Psychology back in 94. But it goes on and on. They find a brown glaze over some of the plants. It turns out it was pure iron that had been embedded in the plants while the iron was still molten. Tiny iron spheres were also found in the soil around those plants. And this was published in the Journal of Scientific Exploration in 1995. In 1999, a British investigator, Ronald Ashby, examined the glaze that we're talking about here through optical scanning electron, uh, optical and scanning electron microscopes. And he de determined that the intense heat had been involved about 2,700 degrees Fahrenheit, which of course would destroy the plants. And uh, there are hundreds of plant and soil samples were collected from a seven-circle barley formation in Edmonton, Canada. The plants had both elongated nodes and expulsion cavities that we talked about, and the soils contained these peculiar iron spheres. And the control showed that uh, none of these, in other words, control, plants that were not part of the circle did not have any of those changes. A mineralogist by the name of Sampath uh, Iyengar, Technology Materials Laboratory in California, examined specific heat-sensitive clay materials in these soils using X-ray diffraction and a scanning electron microscope. He discovered an increase in the degree of crystallinity uh, in the circle minerals in the, in the uh, soil. Statistician Ravi Raghavan determined a 95% statistically significant confidence level in these findings. They have no idea what's causing it. It's clear this was not just some contrived prank for some of them. And so on it goes. Now what was really astounding was the direct correlation between the node length increases in the plants and the increased crystallization in the soil minerals. What that implies is a common energy source for both effects. So somehow there was some very intense energy. This wasn't a couple of guys with planks and, and ropes playing games. And the scientists could not explain how this is possible because the temperature required to alter the soil crystallinity would be between 1500 and 1800 degrees Fahrenheit. And this of course would destroy the plants. So how did this happen? They don't know. But there are journals and there are uh, scientists that are wrestling with the puzzles of the crop circles. Not the crop circles in general, those that turn out to be what we'll call real ones, not, not hoaxes. And that's the problem in any research area like this. You've got so much noise, uh, it's hard to find the signal, if you will. Well, let's get to the real core of all of this. What's the biblical view? And uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the days of Noah. You know, Jesus... Uh, gave four disciples a confidential briefing on his second coming. And uh, uh, the four disciples came to him to inquire his return, and he detailed the preceding events that would uh, occur prior to his second coming. And his answer to them, these four guys, is so important, it's recorded in three of the four Gospels, Matthew 24 and 25, Mark 13, and Luke 21 and 22. But he opens and closes that briefing with a, a, a repeated admonition. Take heed that no man deceive you. And that occurs in Matthew 24, 4, and you'll find it's the theme of, of, of the, the entire presentation. We're dealing here in spiritual matters, and the attempt of the enemy will be to deceive us. But in the middle of this briefing, about verse 37 of Matthew 24, Jesus makes a very strange remark. He says, but as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Now in the context there, what he may have been alluding to is simply that it'll be business as usual until, just as it was business as usual until Noah went in the ark, it'll be business as usual until he returns. And most people who read that passage assume that that's all he meant. It's just that it's going to come as a surprise. And yet there are many scholars from the context of the details of that passage feel he was giving us a hint of something deeper. And we really don't, won't understand what he's talking about unless we understand what the days of Noah were like. And so we're going to try to figure out what, the, what did Jesus really mean? As the days of Noah were, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. So what you really need to do to get a handle on the UFO thing, strangely enough, is to do your homework in Genesis chapter 6. And I want, want you to notice the first two verses, and I want you to pay attention that the first two verses are a single sentence. 
Many people stumble because they don't realize that's a single sentence. I'll just see why it come, what I'm getting at in a minute. Genesis 6, verse 1. And it came to pass, when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them, that the Benaiha Elohim, the sons of God, as it's translated, saw the daughters of men, that they were fair, and they took them wives of all which they chose. One verse. Now the question is, um, this strange phrase, sons of God, uh, that can mean anything to us. Let's find out what the text really means, sons of God. It, what it is in the Hebrew is, remember Hebrew goes from right to left, so if you're watching the slides here, uh, remember all languages go towards Jerusalem. Nations that are east of Jerusalem go from right to left, the language. Nations that are west of Jerusalem go from left to right. So just breaking, so Hebrew, Aramaic, Arabic, uh, Sanskrit, whatever, they go right to left. Anyway, uh, so if you're reading the Hebrew here, recognize it goes from right to left. Bene ha Elohim, the, 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 the sons of the God. Now, sons of God, Bene ha Elohim is, is a term that's always used of a direct creation of God. Adam was a direct creation of God. You and I, in the natural, are not. We're sons of Adam. That's our problem. That's what the book of Romans is all about. And, uh, but as many as received him, to them gave he the power to become the sons of God. The term is, has technical meaning in the New Testament as well as the Old. In the Old Testament, this term in the Hebrew, in Job 1.6, Job 2.1, Job 38.7, uh, is always used of angels, because they are a direct creation of God. In the New Testament, also Luke 20.36. Also the book of Enoch, now I'm, don't misunderstand my use of this as a, as a citation here. The book of Enoch was very popular from about the second century before Christ to the second century after. It is not an inspired book, I wouldn't treat it that way, but it is useful in understanding the vocabulary and the grammar of the time. And clearly in the book of Enoch, it made, this term is used there also to refer to angels. And it deals with it greatly. The Septuagint, this is the translation of the Hebrew scriptures that went from Hebrew to Greek. If you were a, a Jew living in the time of, of uh, say, the uh, second century before Christ, the enforced language worldwide, the commercial language, was Greek. Thanks to Alexander the Great and following, uh, that was the common language. If you were a Jew uh, in business anywhere in the world, you had to speak Greek to survive. You may have known Hebrew for religious purposes, but Hebrew was to the Jew in those days what Latin is to a Catholic today, basically a language for religious purposes. So one of the things, if you were Jewish in those days, what you would have liked to have had is a copy of the, what we call the Old Testament, the Tanakh, uh, in Greek, so he could read it. And because of that, under Ptolemy Philadelphus, he funded the translation of the Hebrew scriptures into Greek, started about 285 BC, finished about 270 BC, and the result of that work product, he got 70 of the top scholars, the word Septuagint is just 70, a uh, fancy word for, uh, Greek word for 70. He got the 70 top scholars to do the translation, took about 15 years, and uh, the result of that we have copies of. And it's known as the Septuagint, translation of the Old Testament. And it gives us the benefit of the precision of Greek on some of these issues. So it's a very, very powerful uh, resource for scholars. And the Septuagint also makes it clear that we're dealing here with uh, uh, angels, as we think of them. Now in Genesis 6, it came to pass when men began to multiply in the face of the earth and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair and they took them wise of all whom they chose. The word sons of God, of course, is Benai Elohim, sons of God, direct creation, term for angels. Saw the daughters of men. Now by the way, what that really says in the Hebrew is Benaf Adam, daughters of Adam. I mention this because there have been contrived some strange interpretations of this passage that are commonly taught in most seminaries. And it's tragic because there's a view of this passage that has no scriptural support. And we'll talk about that because you'll, you'll run into it. Many people think that, that uh, this is strange stuff. And it is strange. It's even stranger than most people realize. So, um, now when you get down to verse 4 of Genesis 6, it says, there were Nephilim 
in the earth in those days. And also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them, the same became the mighty men which were of old, men of renown. What this verse seems to indicate is that these Nephilim were offspring of a strange union. The sons of God, these are angels according to the Hebrew ter- uh, uh, precision here. They came in unto the daughters of men. Daughters of Adam, incidentally. This is not just Cain and Seth and any of that. This is the daughter, these, these are daughters of men. And they bear children to them. It's those children that are the Nephilim. Now what on earth is the Nephilim? That word, Nephilim, is a key word. We're going to talk a lot about that. Nephilim means the fallen ones. It comes from the verb nephal, which means to fall, be cast down, to fall away, to desert. That's what a Nephilim is, a deserter, in a sense. What the passage portrays, and it's very difficult for many people to absorb this, it portrays fallen angels. These are not the good guys. Remember when Satan fell, a third of the angels fell with him. Not all of them, but a group of them, apparently, and we'll talk more about this in a minute, chose to try to create a hybrid race. By cohab- by, I don't know the technology. Uh, I, I'm not going to get into that. But they apparently... Uh, uh, where, see, angels can't multiply. Angels are eternal. There's, uh, reproduction is a process for mortals. But at the same time, Satan's got a problem. A third of the angels fell with him, so he's got a deficiency of two to one in any war that comes up. Right? He's got to find a, find a way to strengthen himself. This may be, this is just a, con- a conjecture that floats around. Now, the offspring are Nephilim. They're also called the Hagibarim, the mighty ones. And uh, Now, where the confusion starts to set in is when this Hebrew passage was translated into the Greek in the Septuagint, the word they used for the Nephilim was gigantes. It sounds like giants, and it turns out they were giants, but that's not what the word means. Gigantes comes from gigas, which means earthborn. So in the Hebrew, they're called the fallen ones. In the Greek, they're called the earthborn. And uh, so let's keep that in mind. The fact that they were giants is like a pun. Yes, they were giants, but that's not what the word means. It carries a different meaning. Let's go on a little further in verse 9 of Genesis 6. It says, These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations, and Noah walked with God. Terrific verse. We've all read it. But most of us may not pay attention to what that's really saying. These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations. What does that mean? Well, the word perfect in the Hebrew is tamim. What it means is without blemish, sound, healthful, without spot, unimpaired. What that verse seems to indicate is that Noah's genealogy was unblemished. Now, this comes on right after the verses that talk about these strange goings on where these fallen angels are, have created some weird form of hybrid, but Noah was unblemished in his generations, and that's one of the reasons that God chose Noah and his three sons and their four wives to start over again. The purpose of the flood was not just that there was sin in the land. There was, and that's emphasized. But if, if, if sin brings the flood, we better get some life jackets. No, there's something far deeper going on. That's what I want to sensitize you for when you do your own study and come to your own conclusions. But I want you to recognize there's something much more profound that God, there's a problem that God was solving. And that is that Satan's strategy was to contaminate the human race. Now, by the way, if, if this view is correct, I'm presenting to you what's sometimes called the angel view of Genesis 6. That is not taught in most seminaries. And I'll come back to that in a minute. But if that view is correct, as I've suggested from the exegesis of the Hebrew in Genesis 6, it will be confirmed in the New Testament at least twice, and it is. When you get to the book of Jude, Jude makes an allusion to this very event in Jude verses 6 and 7. Jude is just one chapter. But in verses 6 and 7, Jude writes, And the angels, and by the way, this is in the Greek, so it's not ambiguous. And the angels which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation. 
He hath reserved in everlasting chains under darkness unto the judgment of that great day, even as Sodom and Gomorrah, and the cities about them in like manner giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Jude is talking about judgment on the bad guys. And he mentions among these things, these angels which sinned back in Genesis 6. These angels which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, he hath reserved in everlasting chains. These angels that participated in Genesis 6 apparently are chained awaiting a special judgment. We'll talk, it's going to, Peter's going to talk about that in a minute. And he even, he even uh, Jude asks, adds something else here. He makes a comparison between the sins of Sodom and Gomorrah and the sins of these angels in that they were doing that which is unnatural. Sodom and Gomorrah, homosexuality. We're all familiar with that. Even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh, are set forth an example of suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. He's using that as an additional exemplar, lumping the angels with him. The angels went after strange flesh, so did Sodom and Gomorrah. They're both reserved for special judgment. You follow me? You can read it, check it out yourself. That's one confirmation. That's in Jude. Let's take a look at, uh, it, see, they left their own habitation. We're going to come back to that in a minute. And going after strange flesh is the, is the illusion here. Let's turn to 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 4 and 5. 2 Peter, in Peter's second letter he says, For if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to Tartarus, it's translated hell in your English Bible, but the Greek word is Tartarus, and it's the only place that word appears in the Bible. I'll come back to that. If God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to Tartarus, and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved on judgment, and spared not the old world, but saved Noah, and he goes on. So Peter does a couple of things here. He again alludes to the angels that sinned, they're cast into Tartarus. That's a, I'll tell you more about that in a minute. And they're reserved unto, for a final judgment. And spared not the old world, but saved Noah. In other words, he ties that event to the days of Noah. So he not only confirms Genesis 6, but he also links it to the days of Noah. Okay. The word Tartarus deserves some comment. The problem with this word is it doesn't appear anywhere else in the Bible, but it does appear in Greek literature. It's the Greek term for the dark abode of woe. It is the pit of darkness in the unseen world. It shows up, in, for example, in Homer's Iliad, where Tartarus is as far below Hades as the earth is below heaven. So where is Tartarus? I don't know, and I don't want to find out. So Tartarus was a term for a deep, special, it, is so, it, it was regarded as, as far below Hades as the earth is below heaven. So it's... It's where these angels are chained until, until the final thing. Now, if you study Greek, classic Greek mythology, you run into the titans. These, these creatures in, their myth, in the legends and the myth, myths were partly terrestrial and partly celestial. They rebelled against their father Uranus. And after a prolonged contest were defeated by Zeus and condemned where? Into Tartarus. Do you see a parallel brewing here? I'm going to suggest to you that the legends of the ancient Greeks embody the truth of what really happened in the past, that there were these strange creatures generating hybrids that the Greek called titans. And we see Zeus in many forms. We see, we see uh, Atlas and Hercules. Atlas and Hercules from, from Greek mythology were what would be called in the Hebrew Nephilim offspring of an intermarriage between a god and a woman. And uh, so, now these legends, we, we obviously we see in the Sumer culture, in Assyria, in Egypt, I'll show you a few things, in the Incas, the Mayan, the Epic of Gilgamesh, in the Persian mythology, and certainly in the Greek mythology, which most of us as products of Western civilization are familiar with, also in India, Bolivia, South Sea Islands, Every one of these cultures, including the American Indians, every one of these cultures have legends of the star people. These people that came, these gods or demigods, whatever, came and cohabited with women and produced, a, produced hybrids. I discover from some uh, apparent experts in the American Indian culture that this business of holding a hand up saying how, that's Hollywood. Uh, 
But what apparently was the practice when they met a stranger was to hold up the hand so they could count fingers. They had a terror of the six-fingered people. And if you go to uh, the ruins at Chaca, New Mexico, one, they have a, one of the exhibits there that you want to take a look at are the famous pictographs. And among those pictographs, you'll find the, the fearsome six-fingered hand as part of that. They, I came across something else that's kind of the Pawnee Indians have an account that Bill, you remember uh, Buffalo Bill, real name was William Cody. He wrote his autobiography in 1920. Very colorful guy. You can get his book, it's popular. But there's an interesting quote in his book by, Bill, by Buffalo Bill, Bill Cody, uh, published in 1920. He says, while we were in the Sand Hills scouting the Niobara uh, country, the Pawnee Indians brought into camp some very large bones, one of which the surgeon of the expedition pronounced to be the thigh bone of a human being. The Indians said the bones were those of a race of people who long ago had lived in that country. They said these people were three times the size of a man of the present day. And they were so swift and strong that they could run by the side of a buffalo and taking the animal in one arm could tear off a leg and eat it as they ran. <laughs> I don't know what to make of that. It's in his autobiography. It's published in 1920. Uh, I don't think he was worried about UFOs and stuff, but you, it is an uh, interesting allusion to the Indian, Indian lessons. Uh, in the uh, early country, uh, Asher, they, ha they always speak of the flying god of Asher. And this diagram you see in many, many of the ancient uh, monuments of a, a man with a bow, like Nimrod perhaps, and, uh, the, uh, and the wings. Uh, and you see this on the monuments. Here's an example of them. As you go through Egypt, this is a, a, a snapshot in one of the tombs. Of, I think it's Ramesses II, but you see in all of them. You'll notice on the headers of these, uh, uh, of these passages, again, you see a, uh, uh, the way, a flying disc again and again and again uh, as you go through Egypt. You look at the, the headers on uh, many of these monuments. You look up there and you always see the flying disc, sometimes with a snake involved. And uh, you see it again and again and again. Sometimes you see uh, uh, a person involved with these, and you even find the disc being transported from place to place. So this seems to be something more than simply a symbol of, a, um, of, a, of a, some icon that they're worshiping. Well, you say, gee, Chuck, this angel view is kind of strange. I hadn't heard of that before. You know, I, when, when, our, when our book was published, I got, the, I got telephone calls from top executives of some of the Christian publishers that were angry, not at me, at their seminary background, because many of them are graduates of, of, of seminaries, and they were never taught the angel view. And uh, that's disturbing. You may not agree with it, but it still should be taught as one of the alternative views. What most people have taught, you'll find it in many Bible handbooks, stuff, the so-called lines of Seth view. The idea that we're the sons of God really refers to the, 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 the line of Seth, the leadership of the line of Seth. And uh, the daughters of Adam really means the daughters of Cain, not Seth. And the sin that uh, is, is dominant there is their failure to maintain separation, is that concept. Now, it doesn't explain how the offspring of these unions resulted in these strange creatures. You know, if you have a believer and unbeliever marry, they may have monsters, but not, they're not monstrous. Okay. Um, this whole view of the so-called lines of Seth emerged in the 5th century in the early church. Celsus and Julian the Apostate used the traditional belief. See, this belief that I've shown you was taught by the ancient rabbis in, in the Old Testament period and also taught by the early church up through the 5th century. But Julian, uh, Celsus and uh, uh, Julian the Apostate used the traditional belief to attack Christianity. They made fun of these people who thought the angels and so forth. They attacked it. Julius Africanus resorted to this Sethite idea as a more comfortable ground. It's more, people find that more, less spooky. And uh, it just, uh, Cyril of Alexander used it to repudiate the orthodox position. Augustine comes along, who it was a profound influence, and he did many, many great things. He, he dealt with a number of heresies, but he embraced the Sethite series, and that, of course, uh, made it uh, orthodox. And so this view of this line of Seth prevailed all through the medieval church. It isn't until you go back to the text and do your homework that you begin to realize that the line of Seth has absolutely no scriptural support. The text itself, the sons of God is never used of believers in the Old Testament. That, that, that's contrived. 
Seth was not God. Cain was not Adam. The sons of God are not the sons of Seth. And uh, the daughters of Adam were not just the daughters of Cain. They were both. That if you recognize, recognize the first two verses are one sentence, a lot of that becomes very obvious. And if, if there's daughters of men, where are the daughters of Elohim? There's, if there's sons of Elohim, where's the daughters of Elohim? See, you sort of wonder, what, what, there's no mention of that. The grammatical antithesis is ignored, and I won't get into that here, but this idea of maintaining separation doesn't occur until chapter 11 of Genesis, not 6, it's five chapters later that we have the Babel and all of that. The separation is imposed upon Isaac and his following, not on Ishmael or the others. It was Isaac and Jacob that were told to keep themselves separate. And that was not imposed on Seth and Cain. That's all contrived. In fact, Genesis 6 verse 12 says, All flesh was corrupted. So the idea that lines of Seth were the good guys and the line of Cain was the bad guys is contrived. That's not what it's all about. See, the inferred godliness of Seth is contrived. Why was only Enoch and Noah's eight spared? Were they only good guys? No, it's God's grace, of course. They took wives that they chose. It implies some forcing functions here. And if that's all, if, they, if Seth were such good guys, why did they perish in the flood? Doesn't, see, it doesn't, doesn't compute. And uh, it, Enosh, it was incidentally Enosh's Seth's son that initiated the defiance of God. Most people don't realize that because of mistranslation. Genesis 4.26 should read, Then men began to profane, not call upon, profane the name of the Lord. So renders the Targum of Onkelos, the Targum of Jonathan, the major Hebrew rabbis, Karp Rashi, uh, Maimonides, and the rest, and of course Jerome. So, the daughters of Cain, this is not a subset of the daughters of Adam, there's no basis for that. And the Cainites were not necessarily godless. You know, I always wondered in Genesis 4, why we have the genealogy of Cain. Because they're going to all perish in the flood. Why did the scripture give us the genealogy? Well, there may be other reasons, but one reason is, if you read the names, you'll find the name of God in them. You get the impression that Cain messed up, killed his brother, yes, but he raised his kids and grandchildren to worship God. He was a godly guy, and the names reveal that. So the idea that daughter, the, the, you know, the, the descendants of Cain were bad guys is, is a contrivance of modern scholarship. And why are they just daughters of Cain? Were the daughters of Seth so unattractive? What's the deal here? So that's, of course. And, of course, the, the, the death knell to this theory is that the, 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 the unnatural offspring. What were the Nephilim then? See, the, they, they were supernatural offspring, the mighty men, the Geberim. Does that mean only X chromosomes among the Sethites? There are no women of renown recorded. And, and what really made Noah's genealogy so distinctive? It wasn't contaminated by this, this, these goings on. And as I pointed out, we have these New Testament confirmations. We looked at several of them, and I won't get into that here. The angel view was the traditional rabbinical view in, in the Old Testament. The book of Enoch is just an example of their belief system, uh, emphasizes that. The testimony of the 12 patriarchs, these are not inspired books, but they do reflect the thinking of the times. Jose, Josephus, clearly. Uh, understood this. The Septuagint clearly spells it out. The church fathers in the first few centuries, Philo, Justin Martyr, Irenaeus, and the rest of them, all taught this. Modern scholarship, Pember, DeHaan, McIntosh, Dillich, Gablin, Arthur Pink, Donald Barnhouse, who I respect highly, Henry Morris, Merrill Unger, Arnold Fruchtenbaum, terrific scholar, Hal Lindsey, Chuck Smith, others. Modern scholarship recognizes the angel view. The Sethite view is uh, the text itself destroys it, the inferred separation is nonsense. The inferred godliness is contrived. The inferred Canaanite substitute of the Adamites is not contrived. All this is contrived. The unnatural offspring implied is the death knell to the view in my opinion. Of course, the New Testament, Jude and Second Peter, nail it. But there's another issue as I got into this, not just for this study. It's important for us to understand that the Nephilim were not confined before the flood. We don't know how they came about. But they were Nephilim after the flood, when, Josh, when uh, Moses sends in the 12 tribes. In Numbers 13, verse 33, they encountered the Nephilim in the, in the land. Who built the pyramids? That's you know, another quick ancillary question here. Who built the pyramids? The Great Pyramid of Giza, the Stonehenge in Britain, and the circle of the Rephaim in the Golan. And uh, they're up in the Golan Heights, there's an unexplored monument we discovered. Uh, up there that is called the Gilgal Rephaim. This is, who are the Rephaim? And uh, the, the circle of Rephaim is five circles, 20 ton stones, about 155 meters in diameter, dated to about 3000 BC. It's built on a flat plateau. And by the way, you can only detect its architecture from above, strangely, and so forth. 
Um, there's, there's some others too that are, if you fly over that area, you see the hints of others. These have never been explored. And uh, the point I want to get across, it's, it, it startled me to realize that this is not simply a study in Old Testament ancient history. It is essential to understand, if you're going to understand your Bible, understand prophecy. You need to understand that there were, there were Nephilim, Nephilim after the flood. In Genesis 4, it says there were, there were um, Nephilim in those days and also after that. even hints at it right there. In Genesis 14 and 15, we discover there are four tribes at least, the Rephaim, the Emim, the Horem, and the Zamzumim, that Joshua was instructed to wipe out every man, woman, and child. Boy, that sounds like genocide. It was. Because we had the same thing, not a flood this time, it was a local situation. And uh, Arba, Anak, and his seven sons, the Anakim, are talked about not just in the Bible, but also in Egypt, by the way. They were encountered in Canaan, Numbers 13:33, when the when the... Uh, 12 tri spies went. The, when they came back, the, Joshua and Caleb had the good report. The other 10 guys said, hey, there's Nephilim in the land. That's the word they used. They were giants. We are like grasshoppers in their sight. That's not an exaggeration. They had reason to be terrified. Obviously, Joshua and Caleb had uh, faith in God. We're, you know, God's on our side. Let's go. But, uh, and it's easy to disparage the other 10 guys. You need to understand they had, on the one hand, some reason to be cautious. In Deuteronomy 3, in Joshua 12, we encounter Og, the king of Bashan. He's the king of the giants, the Rephaim. Goliath, remember he had four brothers. That's why David picked up five stones when he crossed the brook. Why? He was ready for all five of those guys. See, one of the things you can go through the whole Bible and study the Bible in terms of Satan's strategy to try to thwart the plan of God. And when God indicates that, the, that, it's, that the, his redemptive plan is going to come from the seed of the woman... He starts attacking Adam's line in Genesis 6 with the, with the Rephaim, which of course, I mean with the Nephilim. And that's uh, God's response, of course, to the flood. Genesis 12, when God calls Abraham, now Abraham is singled out. As God refines the visibility more precisely of how his plan is going to work, it allows Satan to focus his attack. When Abraham's called, Abraham gets singled out for Satan's uh, uh, mischief. The famine in Genesis 50, the destruction of the male line in Exodus 1. Satan's attempt to thwart the, even when they get out, Pharaoh's pursuit of, uh, of in the Exodus. It was um, now when God calls Abraham, He tells Abraham in Genesis 17, 15 and 17, that there, the, he, He's going to leave there, and four centuries later, His descendants will come. Well, that lets Satan know He's got four centuries to lay down a minefield, and that's what we're dealing with here in the Rephaim in the land. And when God calls David in 2 Samuel 7, it allows Satan to focus on David. And uh, the attacks on David's line. Jerome kills his brothers in 2 Chronicles 21. The Arabians slew everyone but one, Azariah. Uh, uh, Athaliah kills all but Joash in 2 Chronicles 22. Every, every time there's an attempt to wipe out all the royal line, some servant hides a baby, whatever, there's always, uh, it slips through. And uh, Hezekiah, Isaiah 36 and 38, another example. When you get to the Persian period, here's Haman trying to wipe all the Jews, wipe out all the Jews. And uh, uh, that's Satan's strategy to try to thwart the plan of God. And had it not been for Mordecai and Esther, he, it, would, it would seem he might have succeeded. And uh, New Testament strategies. Remember Joseph fear when he found out Mary was pregnant. He was going to put her away privately. God says, no, no, don't do that. That's part of my program. Herod's attempt, when he wipes out all the babes in Bethlehem. It's Satan's attempt to wipe out God's plan. At, 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 when they, at Nazareth, in Luke 4, when Jesus uses Isaiah as his mandate for his ministry, Isaiah 61, they're going to throw him off a cliff, but he slips away. In Mark 4 and Luke 8, there are storms at sea, and I think they're both supernatural ones. That's why got, uh, Jesus rebuked the sea and so on. And, of course, the ultimate thwart was the cross. The cross. And this, this is all summarized in Revelation chapter 12. You can study it there carefully. But the main point of all of this is that Satan is not finished yet. And that may be what the UFOs are, are, are a preamble to. By the way, what does the Golan Heights, Hebron, and the Gaza Strip have in common? They're in the Newsday all the time, right? These are the areas that Joshua failed to exterminate the Rephaim. The word Rephaim means the dead, the walking dead. Isaiah 26, 14 says they cannot be resurrected. These are strange creatures. And uh, it's interesting if you study the strongholds 
uh, that uh, they fail to defeat. You'll notice that they're, those same regions are the territories, the so-called West Bank, that are in dispute today. I think that's fascinating. The, the Joshua's, not Joshua, but his, his descendants failed to deal with these issues, and they plague them to this very day. The Golan was called uh, Bashan, and it's just when Jesus is hanging on the cross in Psalm 22, verse 12, he says a strange thing. He says, many bulls have compassed me, strong bulls of Bashan have beset me around. I have no idea what that means, but I suspect he's not talking about cattle. I think he's talking about some kind of demon oppression that's involved. I think that, and it's an allusion to the Rephaim. Let's talk a little bit about the nature of angels, because that's really at the root of this problem. You notice, we learn a lot about angels by looking at the Bible. They always appear in human form. They look human. In fact, many people entertain them unaware, as we find out. Sodom and Gomorrah, the, the homosexuals were after them. That tells you something. I don't want to be too graphic here. And at the resurrection and at the ascension, there's always a pair of angels. And they're like men. They look like men standing there. They spoke. They took men by the hand. They ate meals with them. They're capable of direct physical combat. The Passover in Egypt was there by a death angel. In the in, uh, book of uh, 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 Second Kings, uh, slaughter of the 185,000 Syrians. One angel after night slaughters 185,000 Syrians. You don't mess around with angels. Now, and they don't marry in heaven. Now, that, that, that's a phrase. By, and by the way, I'm making a contrast here. With the demons of the New Testament are not like this. They apparently are powerless except to the extent they can embody some person. They're not like angels. Don't think, distinguish between angel, fallen angels, the bad guys, and the demons. The demons apparently are disembodied spirits looking for embodiment. The angels don't have that problem. They apparently can materialize. All the way through the scripture we see them that way. We do know they don't marry. Can, the question is, everybody has, can angels have sex? The scripture says no. No, it doesn't say that. Jesus says, for in the resurrection, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels of God. He's talking about uh, 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 that in a resurrection bodies, we don't have sex because we, we're immortal. There is no procreation. There is no uh, reproduction issue. And angels, in, he's talking here about the angels of God in heaven. I would not speculate on the technologies available to an angel who falls. And that's what we're really dealing with here. Now, there's a strange word that gets overlooked by the scholars uh, in general, and, and I've, I've participated in some translation issues on this very issue. There's a word called okaterion, and it refers to the body as the dwelling place for the spirit. It only occurs twice in the scripture, and it's very interesting where it does. It occurs in Jude 6, and it's the word that describes what the fallen angels disrobed from. And in 2 Corinthians 5, 2, it speaks of, it alludes to the heavenly body that you and I as believers aspire to be clothed in. Same word, okay, I think it's a technical term that's overlooked by the scholars. In uh, Jude 6 and 7, it says, when the angels which kept not their first estate left their own habitation, that word habitation is okaterion. They disrobed from the, 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 the body that they were given to indulge in this mischief in Genesis 6. The angels which kept not their first estate, but left their ha own habitation, he hath reserved in everlasting chains under darkness in the ju judgment of that great day. Even as Sodom and Gomorrah and so on, we went through that before. The word is Ocaterian. In 2 Corinthians 5, 1 and 2, Paul tells the Corinthians, For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. And for this we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed upon with our house which is from heaven. The word translated house is okaterion. That which those angels abandon is what we aspire to, that kind of, that kind of a, uh, a habit, if you will. Okaterion again. Anyway, let's talk about something else we talked about earlier and mentioned earlier we should get into. Alien abductions. You know, the disturbing thing is there's continuing a deluge of cases being reported that are too weird, too bizarre to take seriously on the one hand, but they're too frequent and too consistent to ignore. And uh, estimates of 1% to 3% of our population have been reported in the professional journals. They all the 
strange episodes seem to involve the implanting or the harvesting of human fetuses as a primary topic. It seems that if these creatures are real, they're very preoccupied with the human reproductive process. And that causes us to wonder, could this be leading to a repetition of the strange events of Genesis 6? Is it possible that this is the hint that is included in Jesus' remark, as the days of Noah were, so shall the days of the coming of the Son of Man be? Dr. John Max, a Pulitzer Prize winning uh, MD, he, uh, uh, head of psychiatry for uh, Harvard's uh, uh, hospital there, and uh, he's written on this area. He says, the idea that men and women and children can be taken against their wills from their homes, cars, or schoolyards by strange humanoid beings lifted into spacecraft and subjected to intrusive and threatening procedures is so terrifying and yet so shattering to our notions of what is possible in our universe that the actuality of the phenomenon has been largely rejected out of hand or bizarrely distorted in most media accounts. This is altogether understandable given the disturbing nature of UFO abductions and our prevailing notions about reality. The fact remains, however, that for 30 years and possibly longer, thousands of individuals who seem to be sincere and of sound mind and who are seeking no personal benefit from their stories have been providing to those who will listen consistent reports of precisely such events. By the way, John Mack has personally dealt with 76 cases himself. He's profiled others. These are people above average intelligence with no prior psychiatric history that clearly are subject to some kind of trauma. And there was a, a conference on this abduction phenomenon at MIT. And John Mack was one of the co-chairmen of that conference. And he says, if what these abductees are saying is happening to them isn't happening, what is? He's saying, what's, what's really going on here? Here's Mack's challenge to the professionals that were there assembled. The high degree of consistency of the stories, the absence of any prior psychiatric illness, the physical changes in lesions. Some of these people have scars from the procedures, and I've encountered one myself on that independently witnessed by others while the abductions are taking place. There's not many, but there are a few. The involvement of small children is disturbing. Not likely they could be conditioned by, you know, the... Well, let's move on. The coming the cosmic deception, what's the biggest lie of all? You know, it's interesting. This all started back in Genesis 3, when God declared war on Satan. He says, I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. And he shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Everybody, and from this verse, we get one of the messianic titles of Christ, the seed of the woman. What many people overlook, there's two seeds mentioned here. The other seed is the seed of the serpent. And so we have the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent. And the seed of the serpent, we find all kinds of idioms, the red dragon in, in, in Revelation 12, the coming world leader, as I sometimes call him, the false prophet in Revelation 13. These forces are still at work, and behind the world powers today. Check out Daniel 10 and really understand what's going on there. All of us have studied Daniel 2 and the, the sequence of nations, or empires I should say, that were re-echoed in Daniel 7, the winged lion, bear on one side, the leopard, the terrible beast, the ten heads. Uh, again, Babylon, Persia, Greece, Rome 1 and 2. Uh, we've been through that in our prophetic studies. and Most people recognize the iron, iron mixed with clay is, is the Roman Empire don't confuse that with Western Europe, the Roman Empire, uh, part one and part two. Well, we live in a world, what's, what's going on in this world? There's a new world order, a world without borders is the concept. The end of the independent nation state. Multiculturalism is in. Check your faith at the door. We're going to all compromise. And this is all heading for a centralized socialistic government. And there are a couple of forcing functions. Every freedom-loving per person considers this an anathema, except the problem is there's no way to avoid it. Nuclear proliferation is part of it. We're on the threshold right now of nuclear war because of this very issue. But there's another forcing function that nobody talks about. The possibility, ultimately, not yet, but coming, of cosmic threat of some kind. You say, Chuck, that's way out. That's fringe stuff. Really? Um, let's talk about the miry clay. You know, Daniel, in Daniel's famous vision of the metal, multi-metal image, the last phase was, of course, the iron mixed with clay, the ten toes. What is miry clay? Miry clay is clay made from mire or dust, if you will. And everybody talks about the, 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 the clay in, in, in the ten toes of Daniel's imagery. No one, I'm, I'm guilty too, paid any attention to Daniel's explanation of it. 
In Daniel chapter 2, verse 43, he's explaining the whole thing. He's interpreting the vision for you. When he gets to this, in verse 43, he says, Whereas thou sawest the iron mixed with miry clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men, but they shall not cleave to one another, and so on. You know, that phrase, I read that a hundred times over the last 30 years and didn't hit me until uh, this in-depth study. Um, they, the, the miry clay refers to a they. It's a personal pronoun. They shall mingle themselves with the seed of men. In order to mingle themselves with the seed of men, they have to be something other than the seed of men. Or it makes no grammatical or, or logical sense. So the they that are going to do the mingling are not the seed of men. Oh, could this be a hint of some mischief in the end times analogous to the uh, uh, mischief in Genesis 6? I think so. They shall mingle themselves with the seed of men. Boy, there it, stare, it stares at me. Well, speaking of UFOs in the end times, you know, I remember uh, Walter Martin, I was on his board for many years. I, my partner and I were the guys that brought him to the West Coast. And we, we, because of his very, very critical minis uh, uh, you know, ministry to in comparative religions, we tried to keep him off this subject because we felt it would discredit his ministry. Uh, I don't hesitate these days for two reasons. One is I've got nothing to lose. My ministry is probably just great. Anyway, uh, but also the times are a little more uh, lucid these days. But in any case, I can remember Walter it, it, using any excuse. He would get to Luke 21, 26, and he'd quote this, Men's heart failing them for fear, for, and looking after those things which are coming upon the earth. And he, whenever he did that, he always gestured with his hand. Men's hearts failing themselves for fear, and looking after those things which are coming upon the earth. And he would he'd make sort of an inverted saucer with his hand as it was landing. He'd say, coming, and he'd just gesture with it. He saw UFOs here, and for the powers of heaven shall be shaken. And I'm not to say he's wrong, but we used to always smile. Walter, get off that subject. Anyway, uh, but the coming great deception, Jesus opens and closes his Matthew 24 thing. He says, there shall arise false Christs and false prophets, and shall show great signs and wonders. Insomuch that, that if it were possible, they should deceive the very elect. What's going to protect you? Your intellectual background? Your knowledge of physics? No way. No way. If it were possible, they would deceive the very elect. The only thing, the only thing that can save you from this deception is your spiritual condition by being in Christ. They shall show great signs and wonders. They're going to do things that are going to uh, uh, violate apparent, our apparent knowledge of reality. We get to 2 Thessalonians, Paul in 2 Thessalonians 2 has a lot to say about this. He says, The mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now hindereth will hinder until he be taken out of the way. And then shall the wicked one be revealed whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders. The wicked one is going to do miracles. Be prepared for some political leader to raise people from the dead. We're not ready for that. The mystery, see, I think the restrainer is restraining far more than you and I have any idea. I, more than we have capacity to imagine. I think after the rapture, it's going to get so strange, it's going to be way out there. Now, where does this wicked one come from? It surprises many to realize the scripture tells us in Revelation 11 and Revela Revelation 17. Revelation 11, verse 7, And when they shall have finished their testimony, the beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them, and shall overcome them and kill them. Where is this guy coming from? From out of the abuso. So he's not just some political leader that happens to be kind of gifted. No, this guy is empowered by Satan himself. And he's coming out of the abuso himself. You get to Revelation 17. The beast that thou sawest was and is not shall ascend out of the bottomless pit, go into perdition, and they that dwell among the earth shall wonder whose names were not written in the book of life. The only thing that can protect you from all of this is your position in Christ. Second Thessalonians Thess Thess goes on, and because they received not the love of the truth that they might be saved, for this cause God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe the lie. Don't assume that, if you, that you can get saved after the rapture. People will be saved after the rapture. But if you've had an opportunity and turned down the redemption of Christ, this is what it's talking about. Because they received not the love of the truth that they might be saved, and for this cause God will send them a strong delusion that they should believe the lie. Be careful. Don't play that game. If you're going to accept Christ, do it now. Don't wait, or you'll be vulnerable to the big deception. Now, the most absurd war is coming. I always fasten with Psalm 2, which is a dialogue among the Trinity. Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves, and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. And it goes on. This whole idea that the world is going to take up 
arms against, um, take up arms against God himself astonishes me. I can understand people not believing God or rejecting God. Yes, I can't imagine going after him warfare. It just doesn't make sense. Why would the world go after him? I think, I, I think, I think the uh, Nephilim thing will explain it. You know, it's interesting that the alien types, if you read all, you go through, you wallow through all this literature, Dr. Mark Eastman and I have spent a lot of time this, going through that stuff, you'll discover there's three types of these so-called alien creatures that emerge. The greys, those are the diminutives, short, you always see them in the, in the, in the entertainment media. There's another group that seem to appear, but sometimes called the Nordics or the Palladians. They, they, they're it's about six foot tall, they're blonde, blue eyed, they look like people. Could be around us now. And there's a third group that are the most grotesque of them all, what they sometimes called the reptilians. These are scaly, weird creatures that look like a refuge from some grade B science fiction movie. There's weird stuff. Well, these three always, these always show up. It's interesting, in Revelation 16, verse 13 and 14, I've always wondered, how does the world go to war against God? And John tells us, I saw three unclean spirits like what? Like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. For they are the spirits of devils working miracles which go forth unto the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. I think God is going to use some kind of strange creatures, demonic or whatever, to draw the world into this confrontation that is part of the, 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 the climax that Revelation and the Old Testament deal with. Well, what's our challenge, you and I? Let's wrap it up. I'm going to give you a statement that I want you to challenge. Don't accept what I say or you flunk. I want you to challenge what I'm about to say, although I believe it sincerely. I believe you and I are being plunged into a period of time about which the Bible says more than it does about any other period of time in history, including the time that Jesus walked the shores of Galilee or climbed the mountains of Judea. That's a preposterous statement. But I believe you and I are being plunged into a period of time about which the Bible says more than it does about the whole gospel period. Now we monitor and, and publish uh, backgrounders and uh, weekly updates on 10 strategic trends and uh, we continue on our website and in our publications. There are major prophetic themes about Israel, about Jerusalem, the rebuilding of the temple, about Babylon, about the coming invasion of the Middle East by Russia, Magog if you will, the rise of China as a superpower, the decline of the United States, or I'll call the American challenge. The European super state that's emerging, the move towards an ecumenical religion while all this is going on as the Pope embraces Islam. <laughs> Global government as we see the nations struggle to, to, uh, in that direction. And there's a, uh, there is a, a, uh, another trend called the rise of the occult and UFOs. Watch for it. Now the ultimate issue of course is none of this. The ultimate issue is that you and I are in possession of a message of extraterrestrial origin and it's the only competent source to deal with these extraterrestrial issues. And this, this record, we call the Bible, portrays us as the objects of an unseen warfare. And our eternal destiny depends upon our relationship with the winner of that cosmic conflict. And where do you stand? What is your readiness for this encounter? And you can't protect yourself with your intellect. You can't protect yourself with your knowledge base in the traditional sense. It's a spiritual battle, and you need to understand that. Paul tells us that in, Rome, in Ephesians 6, verse 12. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. And what's your remedy? Your spiritual armor. Ephesians 6 details seven elements of armor should be girded with truth. Take on the breastplate of righteousness. The feet, have your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Take your shield of faith, helmet of salvation, sword of the spirit. And uh, don't forget your heavy artillery prayer. Now each one of these is, uh, is part of your spiritual armor. And twice Paul emphasized put on the whole armor of God, not just your favorite pieces. To do that you've got to know what these are. And you need to do a very in-depth study of each of these six elements, and obviously, I should say seven elements. Um, uh, we don't have time to do that here, but we, I urge you to make a commitment 
to do a serious study of these things. And don't forget the seventh. Many people stop at verse 17. Don't go to verse 18. All right, we have a 24-hour hotline to the throne room of the universe, and he's anxious to hear from us. And we call it prayer. That's your heavy artillery. Keep that in mind. Now, these strategic trends that we, we monitor on our website, weapons of mass, each one is a biblical trend. Each one is a, uh, a standard category of uh, data collection by the intelligence community, and uh, we tend to monitor them. Weapons of mass destruction, the rise of Islam, the struggle for Jerusalem, the Magog invasion, the rise of the European superstate, the rise of China, biotech and global pestilence is another one, ecumenical religion, global government, and the American challenge. Now, each one of these, uh, we have backgrounders on. Each one of these is on our website, and there's no passwording required. You can get your background by just dialing in. We also will give you a weekly update. Once a week, we, we call it e-news. If you will sign on our website, give us your email address, no charge. You can, you can turn it off when you, if, you, if and so you want to. We will send you each week one page summary of what happened this week that's biblically relevant, and we'll give you the links as to who's following that competently. No charge. It's part of our ministry to make you aware of the times in which we live and its spiritual ramifications. So what do you do besides this? We also publish probably the most popular things we've done. Learn the Bible in 24 hours. It's available as a book. It's also available as a CD-ROM with over 1,400 computer animated diagrams. And it will take you from Genesis to Revelation in 24 one-hour sessions. That sounds audacious, but 24 one-hour sessions accompanied by computer-aided diagrams covers a lot of ground. What it'll do is give you a grasp, a respect for the integrity of the whole package, and you'll be able to navigate all the way through whatever is issue you may have. If you survive that ordeal, we also publish expositional commentaries in each book of the Bible, verse by verse, with detailed notes, diagrams, and what have you, and they're available on a week-to-week -week -week basis or in, as packages. They're also now available on CD-ROM, which makes them much less expensive and also allows many of them to be accompanied by, with uh, computer-animated diagrams. We also publish uh, topical briefings. Most of you may be familiar with our briefings. We have uh, probably uh, well over 80, maybe 100 topics biblical, scientific, geopolitical, what have you, and we're also starting to get into videos like the one that you're watching. And uh, we have other resources, of course, a monthly news journal that the first year's free if you sign up for that. Our internet site is the flagship of our entire ministry. I encourage you to, to look it over. It's been much heralded. We're one of the oldest sites on the net, and we have a, ter a really talented team. The Lord has really blessed us with both the team and the content and the response to it. Uh, the strategic t uh, trends, of course, are monitored there. We also publish e-news, which I've mentioned. Those are free, by the way. Emphasize that. Free. <laughs> We're also a host of the Blue Letter Bible. We participate in its, its early days. It's an English, Hebrew, and Greek text with commentaries, dictionaries, encyclopedias. It's all word searchable. It's all free. But the main thing we have is something that's maybe new to some of you, and that's the Berean Online Fellowship. Mo many of you are familiar with our K-Rations program. That's where you have a tape a week subscription program. It was a 10-minute update and then a verse-by-verse -verse study on some book of the Bible. Many of you may be familiar with that, and that's still going. And we accompany that, of course, with diagrams and study materials for group study, and, and uh, you can even arrange to have uh, course credit for that, uh, university recognized. Uh, we publish this typically in heirloom edition leather-bound albums. For those that are collecting them, they have a way to keep them organized, and there's, it is a university-approved uh, level all the way to the Ph.D. level uh, with arrangements we've made. But the thing that we want to announce to you, we have a new program called the Berean Online Fellowship. Each week you get the verse-by-verse -verse study in real audio or MP3, um, and that includes the notes and so forth. It also includes a weekly global intelligence update, just a little 10-minute what's going on kind of thing. It gives you also access to all our verse-by-verse -verse commentaries in real audio. It's all available to the subscribers, the members of the fellowship. Uh, we have, uh, you also will get personal uh, update, our news journal, online immediately, and it, you'll still get your hard copy by mail. But the, perhaps the most exciting thing is we have online discussion groups. All our members can share and talk about topics, and there's, and, uh, there's a whole chat room structure behind that, and uh, I, part I participate uh, in that, and so does our staff. Um, and, of course, all of this is done in the context of getting university degree credit all the way to the Ph.D. level. And there's all kinds of uh, members-only offers and privileges in terms of access and other things that we're doing. So that's going to be our primary online fellowship. Uh, uh, dial up our uh, website, www.khouse.org, 
No one can pronounce koinonia Laos, let, let alone spell it. Everyone calls us chaos. And our phone number is 1-800-CHAOS-1. And uh, we encourage you to find out more about what we're doing because we're here to do one thing, and that's to highlight the biblical relevance of current events and the, pri the hidden agenda is to get you excited about the Word of God, that, that we can both grow and grace the knowledge of Him. Because we think the days are short, and we've got to rearrange our priorities to really make them count. God bless you.